from Athens, Georgia. This is the clash of the kings of college football. Good evening, everyone. I'm John Buren from the floor of Sanford Stadium, where tonight the 1981 college football champion Clemson University meets the University of Georgia's Bulldogs, national champions of 1980. And to answer your question, yes, Herschel Walker is in uniform. Walker came out with the team and has gone through all of the drills with them so far. As you can see, his right hand with that thumb broken two weeks ago is heavily bandaged, but right there is the proof. He took a handoff without apparent encumbrance from the bandages, and with us right now is Herschel's physician, Dr. Butch Mulherin, who has, as I understand it, Butch, you checked Herschel just before he came onto the field. Is that the case, and if so, what were your findings with regard to his ability to play this evening? Well, we checked him uh, tonight, of course, but uh, we knew Friday that uh, he's progressing very nicely, and we feel that fracture is relatively stable in the uh, type of splint that we have him in, but we, of course, again, would prefer that he not play in the game. Now, uh, you ask if he'll play, and I, I, I feel the situation might develop where uh, Herschel might make the difference, and he might go into the game under those circumstances, but we still feel we'd rather Herschel not play. And that was your recommendation to Coach Dooley, that he not play? That's correct. Of course, Vince all along has told us that what your recommendation is will remain final in his mind. Let's put it this way. You mentioned the possibility that it could get into a kind of game where Herschel could make a huge difference. Were he to play, and were he to get popped pretty tough in that right thumb, what could it mean to him as far as an extended layout? Well, it could cost us six weeks. Uh, we feel like he's pretty safe the way he is. Not 100%, otherwise he'd be playing, of course. Right. But uh, we feel he's relatively safe uh, if we minimize his exposure. Uh, if he got hurt and it would take a unique situation, then it might cost us uh, a couple of extra weeks, uh, a total of six weeks. All right, but your recommendation, once again, is that he not play. That's correct. Butch, I appreciate you yeah. being with us. Thank you very much. That's Dr. Butch Mulherin, who has handled the treatment of Herschel Walker's broken right thumb since it was broken two weeks ago. The Clemson team huddling on the far side of the field. They are the defending national champions, but right now they are not the most popular team on this field here in Athens, Georgia. Georgia, meanwhile, going through their drills behind us. Clemson in their white uniforms tonight. And if Dr. Mulherin's prognosis and recommendation proves to be, in fact, what Vince Dooley will follow, and if, in fact, Herschel Walker does not play tonight, that thrusts the spotlight over onto a young man named Carney Norris, who will be taking Herschel's place in this game this evening. Walker steps his way through there. He is the most celebrated player of his time. Bulldogs are moving the ball here in the third quarter. They go to Walker. Walker shakes one man in the backfield. Only a junior, he already holds six national rushing records, eight Southeastern Conference records, 15 University of Georgia records. Walker, touchdown! In the two seasons since he came out of Johnson County High School, Herschel Walker has become a football phenomenon, a symphony of strength and speed, and while at times he may be unstoppable, we have found that he is not indestructible. Inside the cast is Walker's right thumb. Broken two weeks ago during an inter-squad scrimmage, Walker has continued to work out with the rest of the Georgia team, but he has not participated in any full contact drills. The doctors say it would be inadvisable for Walker to try and play tonight. That has shifted the spotlight off of Herschel Walker and on to a 5'9", 190-pound senior named Carney Norris. For the past two seasons, Norris has been Walker's understudy. He has waited, and for the most part, he has watched. And yet it should be remembered that on the one previous occasion, when he was forced to step in as Walker's replacement, Carney Norris did not look like a second stringer. Two years ago against Ole Miss, Norris fills in for an injured Herschel Walker, gains 150 yards on only 15 carries. On that day, Carney Norris looked absolutely super. He's a good back. I don't think he's a super back. 
Uh, he did come in and, ex and perform extremely well against a defense that's not quite in the category of a Clemson defense. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of confidence. Carney, he's played a lot of football. He's got a lot of experience. He's had some good football games. And, uh, but I, there's no doubt he'll have the biggest test he's ever had. That test tonight against Clemson is one which Norris believes he will definitely pass. He knows he has talent. Tonight he hopes to find out how much. Well, I really don't know how good I am, you know, because I haven't played a whole game. It'll be interesting to see, you know, how, how many uh, how many yards that I can total up. Good, Carney. Don't step away. I'm ready. I'm ready. I want to reestablish re some confidence in myself uh -huh. in my whole game. Okay, that's Carney Norris, and there is Carney on camera as he's getting ready for what could develop into the biggest day of his football career. Carney Norris, incidentally, a native of South Carolina. He will wear number 36 this evening, and he will work from the tailback position as he is doing this drill. Carney Norris filling in for Herschel Walker this evening, at least at the outset. However, as Dr. Mulheron said, there is, of course, the possibility that Herschel Walker still could play. You see filing off behind me right now and almost running over me, as a matter of fact, some members of the uh, defending national champion Clemson University football team. We were over at their hotel a little bit earlier today, and uh, both teams really had a tough time adjusting to this game being moved to a night start. I know Clemson, Danny Ford, was trying to find something to do to occupy his team so that they not get lulled to sleep today, but at the same time that their attention not wander too far from the task at hand. Georgia went to a movie, uh, so there was the concern to what to do with these players during all this time and this night football has created that problem however sliding this game back to nine o'clock has been anything but a problem for one peculiar breed of fan and they are the tailgaters The parking lots that surround Sanford Stadium had by midday today become a series of little cities. I mean, people had set up camp out there. Camps complete with all the modern conveniences. And even though these people knew they were going to be staying late, they did come early. What time did you get in? Most of the tailgaters around the parking lots this afternoon were Georgia fans. Most of them were from Georgia. But for at least one group out there, the journey to Athens had been a pretty lengthy one. Where'd you come from? We got a couple here from Cape Town, Africa. Come all the way to see the game. From Cape Town, do they know about football over there? No, but they're gonna learn tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and among all the faces and all the cars and vans in all the parking lots around Athens today, there was one face that stood out. Can I have an electric train and a new sled? <laughs> Man, I tell you what, if you let the dogs win today. You got anything you want. All right. <laughs> All right, those fans, Santa included, are now filing into Sanford Stadium. The parties began out in the parking lots this morning. They've been going on all day. A really festive atmosphere here in Athens, Georgia. As we showed you on our 6 o'clock news, if you could find 10 square feet of grass today, you could have a party. And if you were on 10 square feet of grass, you were probably in the middle of a party because there are a lot of them going on. And we will be coming back live to Sanford Stadium as we count it down to the kickoff between the kings of college football. We'll be back right after these messages. cars that look bright and shiny on the outside don't perform as well as they could inside because gasoline intake system deposits hold back their lean machine. Why not try a gasoline that could help set it free? Chevron Gasoline's patented cleansing additives reduce intake system deposits to help bring out your lean machine. A car that runs clean, drives smoothly. Day after day, drivers who use Chevron Gasolines help unleash their lean machine. Chevron can do that for your car, too. Try it. 
Well, maybe you better call home. He looked, well, he looked 112. Maybe your brother will come. Terrific. They're wonderful. Hold on, Doris. There's another call. Hello? Hi, Mom. He broke down. Where are you? When you have call waiting, really important calls will always get through. My dad's coming. Oh, good. For more information or to order, call 1-800-282-6279 or your Southern Bell Residence Service Center. Lincoln Mercury announces year-end savings on three of our most successful cars. The luxurious Lincoln, the unmistakable Mark VI, the elegant Continental, all protected by a three-year free limited warranty. These cars are so successful, their sales increase 65% during June and July. And right now, factory-to-dealer incentives can be passed on to save you up to $1,000 on Lincoln or Mark VI. Additional bonuses let you save up to $2,000 on Continental. See your Lincoln Mercury dealer now. At Sanford Stadium at night, first time they've seen this here in Athens since 1951, and that is the ABC Press Box. We'll be turning the telecast over to them in about 20 minutes for the call of this evening's game, a game which has attracted national attention and will be seen by a national television audience. And for most of the people looking in this evening around the country, this will be the first time that they have ever seen a Clemson, Georgia football game. It'll be something new for them. But as most people in this part of the country know, this Clemson, Georgia stuff's been going on for quite some time. Tonight is the 51st renewal of the rivalry. We have a look back at the history of the Clemson, Georgia series from Tim Mazzetti. Seven was the first time these two teams met. And under coach Charles McCarthy, the Bulldogs convincingly shut out the Tigers at Sanford Stadium 24 to nothing. They played each other every year after that up until 1916, a 20-year span in which Georgia took a slight edge in the series. But over the next 46 years, the rivalry died down as the two teams met only 12 times. Well, yeah, I remember a good many things about it because uh, I was a sophomore and uh, had not played a whole lot at that time. Byron Jack Griffith was the quarterback of the 1932 Bulldog team that went to Death Valley and routinely demolished Clemson 32-18. Back then, Clemson was just another game on their schedule. started the game, I remember it was overcast and, and kind of a raw, cold day, and uh, they didn't have too good a team, and neither did we. We were pretty much sophomore, had one or two seniors sprinkled in there, and uh, it was a, a seesaw game. We were managing to stay ahead in score, but... However, during the middle part of the century, right on up to 1977, Georgia cast a constant shadow over the South Carolina school. In a dry spell that lasted 62 years, Clemson managed only two wins in 27 meetings. And the last time the two met under the lights, the place was Sanford Stadium. The year was 1947 and the Bulldogs drilled the Tigers 21 to 6. But it wasn't until recently that the game Clemson, Georgia became the all-out cat and dog fight we've come to expect. <laughs> September 20th, 1980. Georgia playing in front of 61,000 Bulldog fans, took an early 7-0 lead on Scott Warner's 67-yard punt return and managed to hold on and beat the Tigers 20-16. The Bulldogs went undefeated that season and wound up with a national title. Almost one year later on September 19th, the two slammed into each other once again. Only this time, Death Valley became Georgia's grave as Clemson shut down the Dogs 13-3. 1981 turned out to be the year of the Tiger. It's much too early to tell if tonight's winner will become the national champ. Yet a victory is certainly a step in the right direction. This is Tim Mazzetti reporting. 50 previous meetings between Georgia and Clemson. Georgia has won 33 of them, Clemson 14. There have been three ties tonight. The 51st renewal of the rivalry. This evening's game, 
offers an interesting contrast between the two starting quarterbacks. Clemson will have at the wheel a senior, Homer Jordan. He has been their starter for the past two seasons. Georgia will go with John Lastinger. He will wear number 12. He is a junior. But tonight, he will start his first game at the University of Georgia. First game he started since he came out of Valdosta High School. At four and he's, he, wants to, uh, he wants to be in charge. He wants to be the leader. And so, you know, he's got a chance, he's got a chance tonight. Yeah! Hey! Uh, I spent a lot of... A lot of nights this past summer just kind of kind of thinking about things that'll be happening this year you know and I, it's it's easy to think about that first one since it's you know a real big one but you know i try to think about the whole year you know and i just you know i just hope everything's going to work out it you get out there and you start going through the drills and you know you, you kind of look around for somebody to take charge and all of a sudden you realize hey you know i'm, I'm the one that's supposed to be doing that and i kind of caught myself doing that a little bit this morning but you know it's, it really feels good and i you know, I'm going to work hard and try to set an example if I can. Until now, the contributions of John Lastinger to the Georgia football effort have been made mostly on the practice field. His game experience to date has been minimal, but despite his lack of playing time, last season Lastinger did have his moments. Lastinger going to throw along down the left side and tenor for Lindsey Scott. There he is! And Lindsey's down the side, caught from behind around the tenor 11. And Lassen going to keep and follow the fullback. He's going to get five, six, seven, eight yards. Lassen has got a touchdown. He's the quarterback. Uh, you know, there's no question about it. There's no uh, uh, Bug Baloo's not here anymore, and uh, there's no pressure from number two. He, he's got the job, and uh, he'll have it for the whole 60 minutes, so he has no reason to press. It's easier said than done. I mean, it's one of those things. It's, I think things will be a lot easier for me once we're on the field. And when Lastinger and his teammates do get on the field tonight, they will be facing one of the more accomplished quarterbacks in all of college football. <laughs> Jordan, born and raised in Athens, Georgia. He has been running the offensive show at Clemson now for the past two years. Took him to the national championship in 1981, but the last time that he brought his act into Sanford Stadium, the welcome was anything but warm. Jordan was at his absolute worst that day, and he is determined that this homecoming be a more productive one. My last trip there, you know, I didn't perform the way I wanted to. And this time, I like to show them that, you know, I am a, a better quarterback than I showed them the first time. I believe in myself. I think my other teammates believe in me right now. In the matchup of quarterbacks tonight, Homer Jordan would appear to have everything working in his favor. Indeed, both he and John Lastinger seemed very much aware of that as they evaluated each other's relative strengths and weaknesses. He's short on experience, but and I, and I got two years under me already, and, uh, I, and I, I wish him the, the best of luck that, that night, but <laughs> I hope he come out on a short stick. <laughs> I've got tremendous respect for a guy like Homer because cause what he did last year was, you know, that's my idea of the ultimate goal for a college quarterback, to, to lead your team to a national championship. You know, experience, you know, it help out, helps out a lot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he could be on that day, you know, pass for 300, 400 yards, and you never can tell. If you were to look at two quarterbacks, one John Lastinger and one Homer Jordan, and you had a draft pick for a college football team, <laughs> who would you take? Come on. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you what you're talking about right now, right now, I, you, you got to take Homer Jordan. He, you know, he's proven. He's proved what he could do. I'm unproven. That's John Lastinger, and boy, isn't that something unusual to hear a Division One college football quarterback tell you he thinks that the other guy may have a little bit of an edge. But that's the sort of person that John Lastinger is. He's very open. He's very candid. He will tell you exactly what he thinks, and the record indeed does show that Homer Jordan should have a significant advantage in the matchup of the two quarterbacks this evening. However, it should be remembered that no football game ever has been won on the basis of past performance. What happens tonight will be decided out there. And we'll be back to talk a little bit more about that right after these messages. Stay with us. When you buy a foreign car, 
I shall take care of your slightest problem immediately. But when you go back to the dealer with a transmission problem... You gotta wait, fella. I got a hundred cars back there with all kinds of problems. Bonjour. Take your transmission problems to Amco. We'll have your car back to you fast. Amco. Why go anywhere else? In Roswell and Marietta, on Buford Highway, Peachtree, Ponce de Leon, Covington Highway, East Point, and eight others, the, the man, man of Amco. You beat the team you had to beat. Hey, look! You fit it in the dust and heat. Now you're thirsty and hot, and you know what to do, because there's something big waiting for me, and you know it the biggest change you have ever found. Talk is in the one that never lets you down. Talk is in the most refreshing taste around. Great year-end clearance prices are nice, but Pontiac's Move em Out program has made it possible for your dealer to pass on savings of hundreds of dollars on four of these new Pontiacs. That's exciting. Come in and get our best deal, which includes savings of hundreds of dollars on any Pontiac 6000. Save hundreds on any J2000. Save hundreds on any T1000. Save hundreds of dollars on any Phoenix. But hurry, you must take retail delivery by September 22nd to get these great additional savings. See your participating Pontiac dealer now and save. We've had it tough in this state. First of all, that Yankee scoundrel Sherman came through here and tried to burn it down. Then we finally got a man elected president. Nobody liked him. But on January 1st, 1981, I looked up at the scoreboard in the Superdome, and it said Georgia, where I went to school, 17, Notre Dame 10. We had won the National Football Championship. Children laughed and grown men cried. How about them dogs? Coming this fall, Louis Grizzard on Channel 2's Action News at 6 and 11. started right here one year ago, September 5th to be exact. Nearly 60,000 people jamming the stands here at Memorial Stadium, and they had no idea what was in store. They would see their Tigers smother a helpless Wolford College 45 to 10 and go on and win the remaining 11 games. 12 victories in all, no losses, and a national championship that has turned this ACC basketball town into a big league football haven. National football title is probably the biggest thing that ever happened to Clemson, South Carolina, but they only hand out one per year, and the celebration by Danny Ford and his Tigers lasted precisely eight months. For in just a few minutes, it's time to start all over again. Last year was a great year. It's gone. We lost key, key football players, uh, and we're, we got some problems right now. We're not, we're not a good football team right now, nor were we close to last year at this point. Uh, we, we can be a good football team. We can be what kind of football team they want to be. Whatever team they decide to be, it'll be one without wide receiver Perry Tuttle. Lost to graduation, he was an important factor in the Tiger offense, setting school records for career receptions, yards gained, and most touchdown catches in a season. His eighth and final will be one to remember. It came in the national championship game against Nebraska. But without him, the Tigers will display a more diversified aerial attack one that could prove to be troublesome for unsuspecting defenses. I think we got to spread our passing game out, and uh, we got to go to our tight end. We got to go to our uh, two wide receivers, and not just say we're going to hit one guy ten times a game. One of those receivers will wear number two, Frank Magwood, a six-foot senior from Johns Island, South Carolina. He hauled down 17 passes last season for better than 20 yards a catch. The trigger man will be Athens' own Homer Jordan, a sprint-out specialist that keeps defenses guessing. But Jordan knows the loss of his favorite receiver means a more concentrated running attack, and he feels that could be the key. That may be our strongest point 
of uh, the whole game right there, the running game, because we got so many people coming back, you know, the whole backfield coming back, and they got bigger and stronger this year, and uh, they're looking for a big, a big year this year. But when all is said and done, it's the defense that makes this team most impressive. Last season, they gave up a total of 11 touchdowns the entire year. When the opposition had the ball, it gained only 3.7 yards per play. A Georgia team that averaged 446 total yards a game was held to just 255 against Clemson, only 122 yards rushing. There won't be any secrets, no surprises. This one boils down to four tough quarters of football, and who can play them with the least number of mistakes. Their game plan can't be a whole lot different. It's been the last three years, and ours can't be a whole lot different because we know what each other's going to do, and we just have to go out and see who can execute it. Graduation has taken its toll on this football program, and for that reason, there are no number one preseason rankings here. But that doesn't matter because the national championship at Clemson is like the paint on those stands. The vision of it will linger forever. From Clemson, South Carolina, Steve Buckhantz reporting. And much of that memory very much alive this evening as Clemson University comes in here this evening. Not only the defending national champions, but owners of the longest winning streak in the nation. They've taken 13 in a row. And we're getting close to kickoff. There are the lights. The much talked about lights here at Sanford Stadium. 472 individual light fixtures. Each one of them about 89 times as powerful as the average home light bulb. And they've got this place flat illuminated this evening. The playing level. 96% as bright as regular daylight. First night game in Athens since 1951. The crowd is firing up. We are not much more than 15 minutes away from game time. The people are here in their red and their black. Down on the west end of the stands are most of the Clemson fans in their orange. The anticipation is building. Both teams are off the field. We expect their arrival within the next five or six minutes at the most. The ABC telecast with Keith Jackson and Frank Broyles is coming up next. We will have to leave you right now. But we wanted to urge you to stay tuned for the telecast of this evening's game coming up on ABC immediately following our program. And we also want to remind you to join us after this evening's ball game as we will be coming back to Athens live for the post-game comments of some of the players and the coaches that made the difference in this evening's clash between two kings of college football in the night fight in Athens at Sanford Stadium under the lights. That'll do it for us for now. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for the game. Have a great Labor Day, everybody. Goodbye. spring inside the building a new test was being wrapped around the wrist and the broken right thumb of the premier college football player in the nation Herschel Walker the great running back from Georgia his coach Vince Dooley came from the hospital and outlined the future course of action this way well I can only go with what the doctors say who really know what they're talking about and uh, they say at a minimum of three weeks uh, up to six weeks uh, what I Knowing Herschel like I do, I know he'll take the minimum course uh, and will be as, uh, as uh, ready to play as humanly possible one can be. So I would say within three weeks, which basically means I don't see how he can play in the Clemson game or the Brigham Young game. However, the doctors may have underestimated the mending ability and the mental tenacity of this man. Herschel Walker carried the ball in his left hand in practice. Would he or wouldn't he not play against Clemson? Last night, he said this. Right now, I have uh, sort of like a pressure wrap to help keep the swelling out of it. And uh, now it's doing great. Uh, the swelling has gone down and looking real good. But then, like I said, it takes three weeks for it to totally heal. 
And like for tomorrow game against Clemson, uh, right now I really don't know whether I'm going to play that much, but I do think I'm going to play a little bit. Tonight, ABC Sports premieres its 20th season of NCAA football. And during those 20 years, what fun we have had. What marvelous moments we have seen. Let's go back to one of them. 1967, when USC and UCLA met in Los Angeles. And O.J. Simpson carried the ball 30 times, leading the Trojans to a 21-20 win over the UCLA Bruins and the Heisman-winning quarterback Gary Beaven. And tonight, here in Athens, Georgia, the Clemson Tigers and the Georgia Bulldogs will have at it for the 51st time. The 1980 National Champions, Georgia. The 1981 National Champions, Clemson. The Tigers beat Georgia last year in the early season, won the ACC championship, and then won their first national championship, beating Nebraska in the Orange Bowl. More than 80,000 people are jammed into Sanford Stadium in Northeast Georgia on the University of Georgia campus, and they are at a fever pitch in these closing hours of the long Labor Day holiday. College football is back, and you'll hear roaring and thunder tonight like you seldom hear. For it's all full time, the Clemson Tigers 12-0 in 1981 against the Georgia Bulldogs, who were 10-2 season but were the national champions themselves the year before the opening game of the season for both teams at the start of the 20th year of college football here on ABC there is a newspaper headline from Atlanta that sort of typifies the kind of ambiance that exists this ain't football it's war it's a little over an hour's drive between the two campuses. There are 26 Georgians on the Clemson roster. There are seven South Carolinians on the Georgia roster. It is an old-fashioned Southern dogfight. Hello again, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson. And what a pleasure it is to be back with you once again for our 20th year of college football. And this is one of the most colorful and traditional rivalries you could ever hope to have. Remember, it was Clemson that broke Georgia's 15-game win string a year ago. And now Clemson comes into this season with the longest win string in Division 1A, and all oh, the Bulldogs would love to break it. This is also the year of the fifth-year senior, and we think that this season will be one of exceptional quality. Next Saturday afternoon, many of you are going to watch USC in Florida from Gainesville. And then on Saturday night at 9 Eastern time, from Notre Dame Stadium, the Fighting Irish hosting the University of Michigan. That's uh, just the start of it. So September 11, it's USC, Florida, and Saturday, September 18, Notre Dame in Michigan. And there's a lot more to come. Right now, let's talk about this game and talk with Frank Broyles, who's an old Georgia boy coming back down here to wiggle his toes in the red clay. And it's fun to get back to the game, Frank. And the big story in college football the last few days has been the broken thumb of Herschel Walker and the impact of it on Georgia's team. Keith, let me explain what usually happens. About 30 minutes ago, Georgia doctor took Herschel quietly in the back of the room and gave that thumb one last examination. He said one of two things to him. It, he said it's, it's not nearly healed and it's too risky for you to play tonight. Or he said he would say it's nearly healed and it's just a low risk. And if he should say this, I predict that uh, Herschel will go right to Vince Dooley and say, Coach, I want to play. Then it'll be le left up to Vince Dooley as to whether it's worth the gamble. All right, a moment on Clemson now. Danny Ford getting his Tigers ready to defend their first national championship ever. And here come the Tigers. They came down by bus today from Death Valley wearing the road white. And they brought everybody who could get a ticket. They only gave them 6,000 uh, to sell over there. But I would bet you there are a lot of Clemson folks who have been shopping Georgia for a long time to get a ticket for this game. But Danny Ford and his people have been preparing to defend their first national championship for the dark cloud of an NCAA investigation over their head. Well, Keith, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Uh, NCAA investigation is distracting. Danny Ford said it's on his mind. It's on the players' mind. And the players can relate to to a possible suspension from bowl games and not being allowed on TV. And when you convert that, that's to the morale of the football team and that affects the football team and the game. But then Vince Dooley takes the other side. He said he thinks that uh, Clemson will use it as a unifying, stimulating element to rally his team together for a super effort. And here comes the roar for the hometowners, the Georgia Bulldogs. Let's talk 
talk about the young man who's got to play quarterback tonight for Georgia, John Lestinger. Well, with Herschel out of the ball game, Vince Dooley has two things to accomplish. One, convince his team they can win without Herschel. And then, two, he's got to change his strategy. And you're going to see the orchestrating and plays for a quarterback to be able to gain confidence from him for himself and for the, from the team. We're going to look at this and see just how quickly Georgia can orchestrate this successfully. That means throwing the short, sure, secure passes. Very definitely. Throwing the tight passes that he can complete and have the team come back, pat him on the back and say, that a boy, John, we're going to get him. It also means probably that Danny Force people are going to firewall their defense and just say, sick him. Very definitely. The thing that any coach would want to do against a young, inexperienced quarterback, and John Lastinger, this is his fourth year and he's never played for Georgia, but about 10 or 15 plays. They're going to go after him. All right, now, the latest word on Herschel Walker. Let's go to a new member of our staff, Ann Simon, who is with Coach Vince Dooley. Thank you very much, Keith. You know, there is only one question tonight, and that is, will Herschel play or won't he? Coach, what's the answer? Well, the uh, doctor says that the rest is at a minimum, so we're going to use him, but sparingly, uh, throughout the course of the ball game. When do you expect to start him? Well, we may put him in maybe around the start of the second quarter. We'll just have to wait and see. But he'll play some. The doctor said three to six weeks until he was ready. How effective can he be? Well, I think his effectiveness will be at a minimum. But we have some plans for him. Uh, we can't play him very long, but we'll try to spot him and use him uh, tactically. And so we just have to wait and see what that is. Okay, Coach. Thank you very much. You. Keith, back to you. Well, I knew he would play. There was never any doubt in my mind a man was going to play in this ball game. It just means too much in the Deep South. Georgia and Clemson coming up from Sanford Stadium. It's been many years since a night football game was played between the Hedges here at Athens. 1951 was the last one. And what a great one we have with a newly enlarged stadium with the bright lights shining down on Clemson and White and Georgia in the red and black. And tonight's officials, Pistol Pete Williams, R.P. Williams is the referee. He's out of the Southeastern Conference. Scott Dawson is out of the ACC. Joe Curtis out of the SEC. Ray Menton, ACC. And Bill Stanton, Southeastern Conference. Bo Hackney, ACC. Uh, Ray Moon and uh, Billy T is also working with them. And you're looking at Tony Flack, number eight, a freshman, and Daryl Jones, number 17, a junior. They are the deep men. Way Brique kicks off for the Clemson Tigers. It is in the end zone. It is dribbling around and it is down by Daryl Jones. And Georgia will take over. First down on its own 20. With John Lastinger at quarterback, junior out of Valdosta, Georgia. Carney Norris will start. He is from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Scott Williams at fullback from Charlotte. And Chuck Jones, the flanker from Valdosta, with Kevin Harris, the split in out of Eustis, Florida. Georgia. At Buck Ballou here, so successfully for so long. Now young John Lastinger, who incidentally went to the same high school and caused coach by the same high school coach as Buck Ballou, who preceded him. Lastinger on a roll on the first play. Goes to the sideline. The pass was low and incomplete intended for Chuck Jones. Jones had turned it outside at about the 27, and he underthrew it. He had him open. Jamie Harper is a tackle at 270 pounds. Mike Weaver, a guard, 275 pounds. Wayne Radloff, the center, 260. James Brown at guard, 245. Guy McIntyre at tackle, 235. And the tight end is Clarence K, 225. The Bulldogs have plenty of size up front. Kevin Harris is wide to the right. There is contact along the line of scrimmage as the middleman for Clemson, William Perry, came blasting across the line. The question was, did Radloff pull him off or did Perry try to anticipate? And when William falls on you, folks, you know it. He's 6'3", 310 pounds, a sophomore from Aiken, South Carolina, and it is illegal procedure against Georgia. We have an encroachment foul against the white team. First down and five. William Perry, number 66, weighs, get this fans, 320 pounds. The coaches at Clemson tell me he's one of the finest football players they have ever coached. We'll be watching him throughout the game. I said the penalty against Georgia. Obviously, it's the other way. Encroachment and breaking it up the middle and going for the first down is Carney Norris, the tailback, a senior from Spartanburg, South Carolina. That's not too far from the Clemson campus. The defense for the Clemson Tigers lines up this way. 
Glenn finished Perry, Brown, and Hedden along the line with Rembert and Triplett at the linebackers. The secondary, Arrington, Watson, Childers, and Kennard. And it was Childers, the strong safety, who intercepted the pass last year. That set up the only touchdown in that ball game. On first down, John Lastinger puts it up for the second time. Rips one to the sidelines intended for Chuck Jones. And for the second time in the game, he misses it. We are watching the development of a quarterback who has been on this campus at Georgia four years. As, and as we look at Herschel, and he's not played but very little football. Georgia must give him confidence. They've thrown on first down, trying to catch Clemson, thinking defensive run, thinking run, and uh, Lastinger missed him. The advice of Buck Ballou to Johnny Lastinger was, don't force it, take your time. Second down and 10 for Georgia from the 31. It goes to Norris, the tailback, the blocking on the right side for a moment, and then pursuit by Clemson shuts the door on him at the 34-yard line. Norris is at 5'9", 190 pounds, and coming across to make the tackle for the Clemson Tigers was number 53, Joe Glenn, and Vandell Arrington, a cornerback who came up in pursuit. You're going to see these corners, in particular Terry Kennard, coming off of a free safety position. They fly to the ball. Clemson very definitely supports very quickly with their backs. About like other teams support with linebackers. Third and long. Third down and seven. It goes to Norris. He tries to cut it back in the middle. There is nothing there. Number 71, Dan Finish, belts him down from Hubbard, Ohio. A big senior. Number 71. It brings up fourth down, and it brings on the Georgia kicking team, and that'll be Jim Broadway. Going back to reviewing that uh, two series with... Um, Georgia, they threw on first down, incomplete on third and long. They chose not to take a chance with Latsinger throwing into the teeth of the defense, expecting a pass, and ran unsuccessfully. It is Billy Davis. Deep for Clemson. Number three is Jim Broadway. He averaged just over 41 yards last year. Normally gets good hang time. Spins this one, not a particularly long kick. Davis gambles on it and takes it. And the Bulldogs wrap him up at the 27. The ball was coming down, dragging its tail. If he hadn't caught it, it would have bounced deep into Clemson territory and probably been down around the 10. So, Clemson will get the ball. We have no score in the first quarter. You can't For Clemson at their own 28-yard line. And the Tigers come to the attack with Frank Magwood coming wide to the left side. Homer Jordan coming home out of Cedar Shoals High School right here in Athens. Went to Clemson, and he turns around and hands the ball off inside. The running backs are Jeff McCall and uh, Cliff Austin. It was McCall carrying the ball. There's Homer. He's not too big. Six-footer, 180 pounds, very quick. McCall's a heavyweight back there at 225. Austin weighs in at 195. Magwood, the flanker, is a 188-pounder. And Jeff Stockstill is a six-foot-two-inch split in. And he's at the top of the picture. Homer Jordan on second down and five from about the 33. Gives the ball off this time to Austin. Austin hit behind the line of scrimmage. And he was hit by Jimmy Payne, number 87. And Jimmy Payne has got to be a key man for Clemson to worry about tonight. Number 87, Jim Payne, all conference as a sophomore, all conference as a junior. Watch him make his play. He is Georgia's big playmaker, penetrating in the backfield, keeping his feet moving. Georgia relies on him to really stop other teams' drives sometime before the score. He went right past Dale Swing, the center, on the snap of the ball. Now we've got motion for the first time in the ball game. Jeff Stocksville, Homer Jordan hands the ball off. Cliff Austin has it. Austin has a first down for the Clemson Tigers as he runs it over the right side past the 40-yard line. And big blocking out there by Brian Butcher and Bob Mayberry. Gary Brown is 244 up front. James Farr, 230, a guard. Gary Massaro, the starting center, 235. Brian Butcher in at 255. And Bob Mayberry at 245. And that's where he ran on that carry with the Bubba Diggs, the tight end at 220. So it's first down for the Clemson Tigers at their own 41. No score in the first quarter with 11 and a half minutes to go. Again, it is stock still in motion. Georgia with a four-man front up there. As they peel off on the corners, they give the ball over the right side to Cliff Austin once more, and he gets a couple of yards on that particular carry with Jack Lindsay making the tackle for Bulldogs. Here are the Georgia people up front. Dale Carver it in. Jimmy Payne, Jack Lindsay, Tim Crow, Stan Dooley. The linebackers are Thurston and Forge. The secondary, Harris, Flack, Hogue, and Sanchez. Sanchez, the J.C. transfer, and Tony Flack is a freshman. Very unusual. You see Vince Dooley 
starting a freshman. But this one's a good one. It's second down and eight from the 43. Scott still again goes in motion. And Homer Jordan now on a roll. He is dangerous. He cuts it upfield and goes to the 49. That leaves him two yards short of his first down. Jack Lindsay, defensive guard, brought him down, and Tony Flack came from the cornerback position. This is an interesting story on Homer Jordan, number three, the Clemson quarterback, came with the Clemson instead of Georgia, came back as a sophomore, played between the hedges two years ago, had a bad game. Last year, he took his team to the Orange Bowl, national championship, devoted the most valuable player in the Orange Bowl against Nebraska. On third down and two, KD Dunn, number 81, is in at tight end. He's a very good receiver, and they'll flex him some tonight, but he's in tight on the short yardage situation. Jordan drops back, sets, flips it back over to Dunn. Dunn hits behind the line of scrimmage. Great play. Dale Carver. Carver read it perfectly. They were trying to set up a tight end screen for KD Dunn. Most unusual call. Third down and one, screen to the tight end. They must have known something, expected Georgia to be rushing from the backside, but Dale Carver plays it beautifully. He smells the play, penetrates, stops the screen before it has a chance to get started. And it's kicking time for the Tigers. Dale Hatcher. Fisher will stop it for a moment. And Georgia is going to be charged to timeout. Bulldogs with a timeout at nine minutes and 28 seconds to play in the first quarter. There is no score in a ball game and the tension is already building. Play for the Georgia Bulldogs. They had that tight end screen set up pretty well. It, uh, every, everything was white on that side of the field, save him, and uh, he sure did mess it up. All right, Dale Hatcher steps in. Number five, led the ACC in punting last year, 43.4 average. Jimmy Harrell is the deep man. For Georgia, got some pressure on him, but he spins up beauty. Harold goes all the way back to his nine and puts it down because he was looking at a wave of white coming down. The Spectacular kick. kick. Keith, uh, I asked Danny Ford what was the hang time of uh, Dale Hatch's punch. He told me he timed him last night. They were 5.4, 5.5. I don't believe I've ever heard of that. He hit that one 52. That's what we have for you next Saturday. USC, Florida, and Gainesville, Michigan State, and Illinois. The Illini open big. Big game, Houston and Miami, and Virginia Navy. George Welch coaching Virginia in his first season, going against the old team, Navy. Georgia working from the nine. Carney Norris for tailback. Great pursuit by that defensive side over there for Clemson. They just buried him. Let's talk about the Clemson defense, which was second in scoring nationally last year. They are an aggressive team. They don't play the bend and not break theory. They play, create confusion, pressure, and throw the other team back. That's the way they feel, and when you run wild against them, watch out. And that's what happened on Georgia on the first sweep that they've run. Second down and 10. Ball is just over the nine for the Bulldogs. John Lestinger turns and gives it off inside to the fullback. And there isn't much there as Dan Finish steps in and takes down Scott Williams. Scott Williams is 211 pounds, a sophomore from Charlotte, North Carolina. He gets it out to about the 12. It'll be third down and seven. And you can see here that nobody, well, that's that's not right because Georgia, well, it, Georgia offense had no freshman, but Georgia started a defensive man, and Clemson actually saw the second play slip the youngster in there as well. Ball comes loose, and Clemson's got it. came loose on the snap and the Clemson Tigers have recovered the football. Keith, this is the one thing that all coaches fear in the early ball game is you can look at uh, Vince Dooley is a fumble deep on your own end of the field and that singer, last thing all he did was pull out early. It was a trap play and when he tried to get away from the pulling guard, he left the ball on the ground. There should be zero deviation in the exchange between the quarterback and the center. Looked like Big William Perry, number 66, all 310 pounds of him covered it. And here's Clemson with a golden opportunity. First and 10 at the Georgia 11. Inside it goes for the fullback. Jeff McCall, and he wedges it down close to the 8. 
right here with Georgia having their backs to the wall after the turnover as we look at coach Danny Ford the coach of the year last year the youngest ever 33 years old when he was made or was he tied as a guitar string this morning at breakfast he, wasn't he? Wasn't he, he, he said he hated tight ball games it's too long a day waiting this Georgia defense has great pride on this part of the field let's watch him perform second down and seven from the eight Stock still goes in motion Homer Jordan gives the ball off to Austin. Austin is down to the six. Both arms wrapped around the ball, protecting it. And he took some hammering as he was nailed by Thurston, the linebacker, coming hard for the Bulldogs. Here they are, sitting just outside the six on third down. You can get a first down at the one. If you'd like to think if you gave the team, the opposing team, a fumble right here, you'd have him third and six. Homer Jordan touchdown. Perfect execution of a quarterback draw that Clemson uses with Homer Jordan, and he takes it in from six yards. comes out to try for the extra point. He'll kick it out of Tony Ferretti's hole. Ferretti's a quarterback. Penalty flag to run. Hollings kick through the middle. Looked like Georgia might have penetrated and then offside. The kick was good. Let's check the penalty. Red team's offside. The so they'll turn it down and take the point. And the Clemson Tigers go out on front of the Georgia Bulldogs by a score of seven to nothing at 7:09 to play in the first quarter. The when, touchdown. When you've got a quarterback that can run, watch what the, how they use him. The draw play is very effective. Georgia is ignoring the quarterback, something that you can do against 90% of the teams in America, but not against Georgia. Here's Homer Jordan coming back home and scoring the first touchdown. Well, Tom Osborne of Nebraska said he'd rather face any other quarterback in the country than this youngster. And I think he meant that because Homer Jordan is effective both with a run and pass. And you can see perfect execution on the quarterback draw. Georgia was looking for the pass, had the rush on, and ignoring the quarterback. Massaro and Butcher didn't do a bad job opening the oh. door for him either, did they? Oh, it was a big hole. Oh, yeah. Well set up. Just a perfect call by the Princeton State. So Homer's home. And he's got his team on top by a score of seven to nothing. And the Tigers now will kick it off. And the deep people to receive it for the University of Georgia will be Tony Flack, number eight, and Daryl Jones, number 17. There they are. Jones closest to you. And Donald Igwebuike, a sophomore from Nigeria, will kick it off. Less than 50% of his kicks have been returned in his days at Clemson. And I don't think they're going to run that one back. That's three points. <laughs> right through the uprights. And that is a psychological thing that helps Clemson. Gives Georgia no chance for return as we look at the scoring drive. 11 yards, six-yard run by Jordan, hauling the kick. Fumble, setting it up a direct result of a fumble snap between the center and quarterback, realizing that John Bastinger, Georgia's quarterback, is playing and starting for the first time. Barry Young is now in at fullback for Georgia. 215 pounder from Swainsboro. They'll put a man in motion, Chuck Jones. On a blitz. And look. They went after him. With Andy Hedden, number 12, the defensive end, really the man who got to him. Andy Hedden is the key man in the Clemson defensive scheme because he was a former quarterback. He's played safety man, he's played cornerback, and now he's a defensive end, and it allows him to use a lot of different schemes and pass coverage and rush. Just an outstanding player. It's second down 11 now as they got Lastinger for a yard loss on the play from the Georgia 19. Looks, he's got to eat it. He gets it up to the 23, 
And there he gets a considerable greeting from number 82, Danny Triplett and Johnny Rimbert, the two linebackers. Here we, here we get a good idea of what Vince Dooley is facing for this ball game. The lack of experience at the key positions. By key, I mean quarterback, tailback, fullback, flanker, tight end, and, and the split end. None except Norris have started. Third down. And about seven. Drop this time. He dumps it off short to the tailback, Tony Norris. Norris is taken down on a good tackle. By Johnny Rimbert, the linebacker covering on the play. And it's going to bring up fourth down and about five for the Bulldogs. So they'll have to bring in Broadway and punt it. And Billy Davis will go back to receive it for Clemson. The Clemson defense did their job on first down. They stunted with a safety blitz and gave Georgia a loss, forced them into a passing situation, and last thing was ineffective. First punt for Broadway was 35 yards. Davis comes up this time, calls fair catch. He has good field position. Clemson has the ball up around the 43. But remember, there's a penalty flag down on the snap, and it might be that Clemson got across that line of scrimmage. Well, Keith, we should say it would be a first down if yep. it's against Clemson. Pete Williams, procedure, Georgia. No, nope, looks bad so far. 31 yards on the punt by Broadway. The short punt, I would imagine uh, Clemson's going to say, we'll take the ball because we got good field position. Here's Pete Williams. Of an illegal procedure against the red team, decline to be first down for the white team. So here are the Clemson Tigers leading in the ball game by a score of 7 to nothing, and they have good field position at their own 43. The nation's longest winning streak belongs to these Clemson Tigers. Yeah! And they're lined up now, double wide left. In the backfield, it is Kevin Mack throwing the block. Jordan's pass is away, thrown into the sidelines. And it is incomplete, intended for Magwood, the flanker back. Kevin Mack is at fullback, a junior out of Kings Mountain, North Carolina, and Chuck McSwain, a senior from Caroline, North Carolina. And the picture coming from the Goodyear Blimp Enterprise out of Pompano Beach, Florida, where the former University of Miami quarterback, Don Fuskanek. Line it. Our cameraman up there with him is Charlie Mitchell. And this is the first time a Goodyear blimp has ever been to Athens, Georgia. <laughs> it's been quite a sensation. Second down and ten. Off the incomplete pass. And off goes. Inside to Kevin Mack, the fullback. And he slashes in there for some decent yardage. Gets it up near midfield. Clemson's running attack. Uh, they're running backs. Our slashers, Frank, they don't really have the man that can dance a little and blow you away with one. No, but they fit the style and the personality of Danny Ford, their coach. And that's good physical runners. A fullback, experienced two there that have played a lot of football, two tailbacks that alternate. That's Austin and that's Wayne. Each series are down. Just physical, physical runners. Third down and uh, about three yards. Get the ball off to McSwain, and McSwain looking for some daylight. Is cut down short of the first down, and they have fumbled the way the Georgia people are dancing around over there. Keith, I think we should set the, the scene of the of the Georgia defense entirely different than um, than Clemson's uh, theory. Georgia believes in in stopping the wide plays and the deep passes conceding short runs up the middle and that's what Clemson will try to do is run and make short runs up the middle and uh, keep the ball by making first down. McSwain was down before the ball came loose so it is fourth down and a yard and here's the punt now by Dale Hatcher with Jim Harrell deep for Georgia. Hatcher first kick was 52. This one's not as long but it's effective. He forces Harrell into a fair catch at the Georgia 18 with a high-hanging kick. So with 3.32 to go in the first quarter, Georgia gets the ball back. Still don't have very good field position. Number 34, Herschel Walker, is on the sideline. Holds all kinds of records already. The premier running back in the country. Surgery on a broken thumb, but he will play before the night is done. It is first down. Georgia at their own 18. Clemson leading 7 to nothing. Mix up in the backfield. Norris and the quarterback wrestling and running together. Carney gets a couple of yards on the carry after the collision. 
So the Georgia offense continues to look unsettled. Well, with a, with a quarterback, running backs that have started uh, very few times, you're going to have some problems early, particularly against a great defensive team like Clemson. As I said earlier, Clemson was third in the nation in scoring defense, and they believe in punishing, pressuring any offense. Georgia's got to operate very, very smoothly and efficiently. That's a five-man front. An encroachment there by Clemson's uh, middle guard. So, Devane, uh, William Devane, number 94, 265-pounder from Jacksonville, North Carolina, encroaching on the play, and it's going to cost Clemson five. De Devane is one of the Bruise brothers. They alternate Perry, the 320-pounder, with Devane. Tom Harper, defensive coordinator of Clemson, told me that Got an Perry, encroachment against the white team. Contact was made. That uh, William Perry, the 320-pounder, only could play about five plays successfully without getting tired. So they used two nose guards, and we'll watch that throughout the ball game. Devane trying to anticipate the snap. So the five-yard penalty moves the ball out to the 25. And here's the first down as Norris breaks it over left guard and runs it all the way out to the Georgia 43. Vandell Arrington finally brought him down. So that's the first big play of the ball game for the Georgia Bulldogs. Here we see the Georgia offensive line. Wayne Ratlaw, who is a football player he makes the key block on Devane and that allows Barry Young number 38 to break into the secondary and he makes a nice gain and gives Georgia some momentum watch Ratloff number 55 he is an outstanding player 65 he turns Devane to the side and there goes Young Barry Young up north, and, uh, on first down from the 43 the carry is up just over the 45 Georgia's best chances in this ball game uh, it would be using that offensive line that averages about 250 pounds. They are experienced. Most of them started last year, and they have a lot of muscle and movement. Second down, about eight. Jones goes in motion. All goes to Norris. Nothing there for Norris. He may have lost a yard. Again, that Clemson defense just firing. Dan Benish, the tackle, made the stop. But look how many people were there with him. Dan Benish was all ACC last year. Watson controlled the block. What linemen want to do, the good defensive linemen, use their hands, and they push the blocker away, and then they have the quickness to separate and move over and make the play. That's just an outstanding play by Dan Benish, number 71. Third down and nine for Georgia from their own 44. All five. Last thing is back. back at the 36. Andy Hedden, the man that got him. Keith, I think one thing that the fans may be interested in, all coaches work hard trying to find the tempo of the other team's cadence. cadence. And once they find that, they practice so they can get the jump on the blitz and that's what Clemson had a blitz and they wanted to get the jump they were over anxious and got offside it, it is the third uh, encroachment or offside penalty called against Clemson and all three of them have come for that very reason you can't believe the effort that we go through to find out the tempo offsides against a white team to a third down the, the tempo of the cadence of the opposing team here's what uh, Herschel Walker and Buck Ballou meant to the Georgia offense in 1981 with Herschel out of there, you can see there is a big hole, and Buck has graduated. Last thing are going down the line, stumble. Turns it upfield for a yard or so and leaves him short of the first down. It'll bring up fourth down for the first time tonight. The football is on the Clemson side of the midfield stripe at the Tiger 49. But the Georgia's got to give it up. That, that, if we look at Danny Ford, 33 years old, national coach of the year, national championship. He's a Bear Bryant disciple, played for and coached with Bear Bryant at Alabama. Jimmy Broadway's in, his two punts, 35 and 31 yards respectively. Billy Davis is deep for Clemson, and pressure on Broadway, but he gets it out of there, and he gets a better kick away. And it bounces, and Georgia puts it down at the Clemson one. They play on real grass here in Athens, and that helped that one, a 48-yard punt. That is dead at the Clemson one. What the Georgia team did, 
exactly what the coach told him and wanted to do. Make a couple of first downs. If you can't score, kick it deep. And Jim Broadway is an excellent kicker. Bill Hartman, the old Georgia fullback and longtime coach, coaches these kickers. And he is an expert at training these young men. And you can see the results of his work with Jim Broadway. Look at the ball bounce up like it had. The man who snapped it, Mitch Fricks, was down there to put it down. So here are the Tigers now, where they've got to be careful. Down on their own one, Jordan, the quarterback, straight ahead, a yard. Listen to these Georgia fans. So the first quarter is over. In our initial presentation of 1982, and the Clemson Tigers lead the Georgia Bulldogs seven to nothing quarter of play. Clemson and Georgia, the Tigers leading 7 to nothing. The Tigers have not had a lot of success here in Athens. It is second down and eight. The ball is at the Clemson three. Double tight in alignment for Clemson here trying to wedge the ball out. They turn around and hand it off. And they give it to McSwain. McSwain gets to the sidelines, dives for the yard marker, and he may have a first down. He took a lunge at it before Jeff Sanchez out of Yorba Linda, California, could felt him. What happened, the freshman halfback, Tony Flack, misses the tackle. No, number eight, number eight, he's going to come in from the halfback. He has got to make that play. Georgia is forced, thinks he's going to force it back in. The 60 Thurston, the linebacker, is played perfectly, except McSwain's speed, 4-4, gets outside and makes a nice game. But he hit the chalk before he got to the marker, so it's third down and about three, short three. Get the cross sideline. Here's Homer Jordan turning it upfield. Loses his footing, tries to lunge forward for the first down, and it looks like he might be just a little bit short. I think you called it right, Chief. If they spot it where his knee went down, where the ball was, it's about a foot and a half short. Well, Clemson is arguing first down, as they obviously should. But Pete Williams will bring the chains on, and uh, this, it's a fancier chain this year in order to uh, help everybody in the stadium and certainly those of us working in the television area to literally define where exactly the ball is. Stretch it out, and he's just short. That much. Keith, I think that if Georgia gets good field position, we'll see Herschel Walker in the ball game for the first time. All right, Dale Hatcher stand back in his end zone. He should hit this one right around the goal line. He has kicks of 52 and 30 yards, but the 30-yard kick was most effective. It was down on the Georgia 18. Good snap. Pressure on. Block. Butler in for the extra point try. The sophomore from Stone Mountain nails it. And we're even at 14.27 to go in the first half of play. Dale Carver comes in from in, blocks it. The ball rattles around. Stan Dooley comes up with it. And we're even at seven. One thing that Keith has surprised you is that uh, Georgia does not have a block kick signal on. They have a return, but they always work one end or the other. Dale Parker from the right of the screen comes in untouched and makes a great effort. He leaves his feet, goes right in front of the kicker, and gets his hands up and blocks the kick. It was, I mentioned it again, it was not a block kick signal. Only one man was rushing. There he is, number 96. Tremendous effort and stand comes in and recovers it for the Georgia touchdown. What a break for the Bulldog. There he is, Dale Carver, senior. Hey, let him pick him up. Woo, will it happen? And does it have a negative effect on the team? It allows the kick to be blocked. Clemson will have a hard time bouncing back. Kevin Butler will kick it off. Few of his kickoffs are returned. Keith, Bill Lewis 
told me, since we always rush one man, even though we have a punt return, just in case the kicker kicks slow, and it paid off. Kevin Mack and Chuck McSwain are deep. That will not be returned. It's beyond the field of play. And so Clemson will get it first down at their own 20. Holy cow, Keith. Two mistakes, early season mistakes, setting up both of the touchdowns. One scoring and the other on the 11-yard line. And trying to, to match up these strengths, Keith, I would say the Clemson offense and the Georgia defense are about even, but on the other side of the ball, I believe Clemson's defense has a little edge on the Georgia offense right now. Bulldogs got some confusion. And they call a timeout. Will Forts, the linebacker, was a counting heads, I think, and uh, that he didn't have out there who he wanted out there. And time is called by the Georgia Bulldogs. They have had 12 men on the field. So we've got a timeout. 7-7 ball game in the first half. Still on the line against fourth West Johnny Davis. The WBA World Light Heavyweight Championship on ABC's Wide World of Sports returns September 18th. Between the hedges in Athens tonight, 82,122. And it's Clemson's ball, first down at their own 20 in a 7-7 ball game. Both teams cashing in mistakes. Ball is handed off to McSwain. And McSwain breaks it for a first down out to about the 32. Jeff Sanchez, number 31, and Will Forch, number 42, bring him down. Another look at the block kick that led to the Georgia touchdown. Keith, I should make mention that any high snap slows the kicker about two-tenths of a second. It takes the kicker, and you can see Carver block the kick. He was untouched. He was the only man rushing. Now let's see the end of the play. Stan Dooley, number 50. Watch him get that ball. Harry he grabs it, and he has, he has the ability to run. It's legal to run. He makes the touchdown. Jordan on first down. Whips one to the sideline. Pass good to Magwood. Magwood is up to midfield and across to the Georgia 49. So Clemson opens it up a little bit now. That was a beautiful call. Throwing in behind Terry Hogue, number 14. Terry Hogue came up on a vertical stretch. Jordan has good protection. He can read the defense. He has a man in the flat. You can see out here, hold number 14, came up and covered the man in the flat, leaving Magwood open for the completion. First down, Tigers, Georgia, 49. They're handling Jimmy Payne. They're doubled up on him. You see it on that last play. And they're handling him right now. Defense and offensive front doing a good job. Ball is given off to McCall. And he's got a couple of yards. Down to about the, close to the 46. I think we should point out that Clemson's offensive line has been rebuilt this year. They graduated four starters. The only returning starter from the last year's national championship team is James Farr, number 60 at left guard, right where they ran the last play. Stockstill is to the bottom of the screen. Magwood to the top of the screen. The wide people, Stockstill in motion. On second down and seven, Jordan on a roll. Throws it on the run. Hits Magwood. First down, Clemson, Georgia, 33. Penalty flag, Keith. Look like lineman downfield, probably. A blocking downfield by the lineman. Tigers walking back. Magwood clapping his hands together, so it's obviously going to nullify the first down and the game. Uh, you're right, Frank. Lyman, it's a new rule this year, a five-yard penalty for Lyman downfield and loss of down. One of the new rules. One, two, three, four, five. Please don't go any further. <laughs> <laughs> well, an ineligible receiver against white team downfield on the pass. Be a loss of a down with five-yard penalty. As we look at the stats, we, we can look at... Clemson passing in the first quarter was minus nine, but neither offense has been able to do anything. As I said earlier, I believe that Clemson's offense and Georgia's defense is about even. On third and 11, Homer Jordan goes short with it. And the pass is complete. And it's where he hit the chalk. He gets just over the 45, down to about the 44. Stock still the catch. Well, let's watch Jimmy Payne. You, as we said earlier, he had 12 sacks last year. He is one of the most fierce rushers, but they're putting two men on him. The first man is going to get him is the tight end, Dunn. 
And then 68, Brown is going to pick him up. And two men can keep most any great defensive player off of the passing. And so it is fourth down. And Hatcher is in. No pressure on him this time. And he shoots it straight up in the air. He's trying to kill it deep. And the fair catch is called. Down at the 16. So it'll be Georgia's football. First down at their own 16. With 12 minutes and 47 seconds to play in the first half. And the score even at 7. Boss man of the Tigers is gone to the two now here in the second quarter. Georgia's ball first down at their own 16. Last thing that sets him up. Hands it off to the man up front out of the eye formation. You have two fullbacks that are getting uh, probably going to wind up with equal time. Scott Williams is in there now. Number 30 just carried the ball. Barry Young, number 38. Carney Norris has done most of the work so far. In fact, all of the work so far. Tailback. Ron Jackson is listed behind him, and there's a freshman named Keith Montgomery they have high hopes for as well. We may say him tonight before the game is done. He gained a couple of yards out to about the 18. Caught it second down and eight. Jones in motion. Lastinger gives the ball to Connie Norris, the tailback. He gets a little head of steam and gets it up across the 20, close to the 23. So they'll be about three yards short of their first down. There are the two coaches, Vince Dooley on the left and Danny Ford on the right. What a career Vince Dooley has had also. His stock and trade, I think, Steve, is organization. He can pick good people, he delegates responsibility, and he's very deliberate in making his decisions and rarely makes a bad one. Only lost one Southeastern Conference game in four years. Ain't bad. Mm -mm. Third down and three. Uh, here's Lastinger on a roll, pulls it down, and will not get the first down. A little bit cautious. Lastinger could have stayed outside, possibly made the first down, or at least thrown the short pass, which uh, happened to be open, but he chose to go up and take the easy way out. Inexperienced, something that will get corrected as soon as he gets over to the sideline from the Georgia staff. They need a big shot here from Jim Broadway, the punter. Billy Davis is the deep man for Clemson. Broadway standing back on her six. He'll hit it about the 10. Here comes the block. Nope. They get a little pressure, but it's a relatively low kick, but kicked away from Davis, so he'll have no chance to run it down, and it takes a Georgia roll. And it rolls all the way back to about the Georgia 31. So the Bulldogs will have the ball at the 31. Here are starters that are out of the lineup. Walker, we think we're still going to see tonight. Norris Brown, who may be the fastest of their receivers on the club right now with a leg injury. Jimmy Gilbert has a muscle tear. And the offensive guard, Gray, who's a big man, uh, has an ankle problem. Coming up Saturday, these are the games we'll have for you. Oh, there's some good ones there. That USC Florida is really going to be something. The Gators winning 17-14 over Miami. On last Saturday, it'll be the Trojans opening game. So Clemson now with the football. First down at their own 31-yard line. Georgia defense on the field. And Stan Dooley wraps up number 32, Jeff McCall, as he tried to slide around the corner. So Mr. Dooley is uh, playing a prominent role in this ball game, isn't he? Yes. St the University of Illinois and Michigan State to be the opener for the Spartans. The Illini have already won one. Houston and Miami. Miami losing by three. And Virginia Navy. Interesting in Virginia Navy. And the George Welch, who coached successfully so long at Navy, will be going against it. Is coming second. It'll be second down and still about 10. Or just over the 30. Homer Jordan stands, throws into a crowd, and it's intercepted. Dale Carver. Dale Carver, who has blocked the front that led to a touchdown, drops off the defensive end and he steps in to make the interception. And Herschel Walker is in the ball game, number 34. And a proud season. I don't think I've ever heard such a roar for one player in my lifetime. Listen to this. Incredible. Ball at the Clemson 41. Lestinger gives it on a reverse. It goes to Herschel, who is coming the other way and picking up the football. It's Tron Jackson. Tron Jackson. It's a clip penalty. But okay. look out, there's a penalty flag back up here at the 33.
They set Tron Jackson out wide, brought him back from that flanker position, and he got an escort down the sideline, but it's a holding call against Georgia. The touchdown is washed away. What a beautiful call. Using Herschel as the decoy, the Clemson defense took off after Herschel, and the first play being a reverse, Clemson had taken the bite. Let's go back and look at the interception. Dale Carver is a senior, and, and you're going to see Jordan just stand there. And he should have against the red team during the run. He should have tucked the ball down. He throws the ball right to Carver. Watch this. Carver is standing there. He doesn't have to move. He intercepted and another great play for the Georgia defense. Then the reverse with Tron Jackson carrying is washed away by the holding penalty against the Georgia Bulldogs. The ball comes back out to the 43, where it is first down and 12. Walker lines up behind Williams. Here comes the blitz. It goes to Williams, and he slashes to the 40. Clemson very much likes to blitz on first down. That's the reason that you have to have a lot of passes called on first down to take advantage of the one-on-one -on -one coverage. There's Herschel Walker, number 34, 15 Georgia records at the end of his sophomore year. Career records, that is. All right, they run uh, Kevin Harris wide to the bottom of the picture. And Lastinger fakes it to Walker, keeps it. Gets it in the air. It is incomplete. He had a man, and he missed him. It was Norris Brown playing with a sore leg. And as I mentioned earlier, Brown, the fastest of the available Georgia receivers, probably. Another flag down, Keith. Hugga. Hugga four. It's third and ten. If it's against Georgia, I would guess they would uh, refuse it. Well, they picked the flag up. Ate it. And they do that. Clarence K goes back in at tight end now. On third down and 10, the ball just outside the Clemson 40. Lastinger had his man Brown that time. He just missed it. Brown's going to throw it. Oh, Dennis just missed him. And it'll bring up fourth down. He saw nothing downfield. He had Chuck Jones going deep. But then he tried to wiggle off the hook and look for somebody else because Chuck was covered, and by that time, Andy Hedden had saddled him. Number 12, John Latsinger from Valdosta, Georgia, has been in Georgia. This is his fourth year. He's only th thrown 18 passes in the time that he's here. On that occasion, he used bad judgment. He could have delayed and maybe found an open receiver rather than just running across the line of scrimmage to get tackled for no Kevin game. Butler is in the ball game now, and he is going to tee it up. He has 60... Be a 60-yard field goal, dude. Six, no, 59. 59. He's going to hit it from the 49. He has kicked 70-yard field goals in practice, according to the Georgia staff. They told me that yesterday. Well, he was two out of four. Two out of four from uh, outside the 50-yard uh, line last year. He tried one from outside of 60 and missed it. Clemson obviously doesn't think that he's going, it's going to be a kick because they have not put a safety man back. They're expecting a screen, a pass, or something. Let's see, the holder is, is number three, Jim Broadway, so it won't, I doubt it could be a pass. Broadway's the punter. 59 yards. Just short. That was very close. So Kevin Butler misses short by just about a yard. And the score remains 7-7. What made Chevy Chevette the best-selling small car in America last year? All the standard features? Reclining front seat, AM radio, shift console, white stripe tires, fold-down rear seat, and lots of other things. Is it Chevette's great gas mileage? A big 30 EPA estimated miles per gallon, 42 estimated highway. Could it be Chevette's low price? It's still one of the lowest priced Ford or hatchbacks sold in America, foreign or domestic. During Chevy's factory authorized clearance, special allowances make it possible for Chevy dealers to save you up to $600.
Buds for all the guys who keep the action from getting out of hand. This Buds for you. For all you do, the king of beers is coming through. Yeah, just for you, that distinctively clean, crisp taste that says Budweiser. For all you do. This Buds for you. The Trojans of USC battle the Florida Gators, led by sensational quarterback Wayne Peace, plus other regional games. Another reason to watch NCAA college football Saturday on ABC. Vince Dooley made a decision to have Kevin Butler try a 59-yard field goal. He just missed. That's fine. But here's the other side of the story, Frank. The other side. gets the ball at the 42 of their own 42. Georgia had momentum. They had field position. Very seldom under the present rule of, of the ball coming back to the line of scrimmage do you see that long the field goal with eight minutes and 25 seconds left on the clock. You're giving up the valuable to field position. So let's see what Homer Jordan and the Tigers can do with it. Outside it goes. Goes to Kevin Mack. Back around the corner. He gets with four, maybe five. Before Terry Hogue out of Huntsville, Texas, brings him down from his rover spot. Remember the name Terry Hogue? As a freshman, he blocked the Notre Dame punt in Georgia's national championship season. Played a major part in the ultimate decision of that ball game. Was a punt or field goal? I think it was a field goal. They won. Second down and about five. Jordan gives the ball away. And there's nothing there for McSwirl. Look at McSwain. They had him behind the line of scrimmage, but he just spun away from Dooley and then carried Stan for a couple of yards. So he got something out of it after all, and he puts the ball right at midfield. Stan Dooley is playing for the injured Freddie Gilbert, but he also played six ball games last year and had eight sacks of the quarterback. He's a very quick player. Runs about a 4'7". He only weighs a 200, 200 pounds, but he has extreme quickness. Kendall Alley, right man to the top of the picture for Clemson. Jordan stays inside with it, stays conservative with it, trying to get his first down. He needed two yards for it, and I don't think he got it. So according to the mark, it looked like the second effort might have given him the first down. It's going to be very close. Strictly second effort by the fullback. Jimmy Payne, number 87, is just a, the premier defensive tackle in the Southeastern Conference. He has the quickness, the speed, but he has the anticipation. He can make all kind of plays. Look at him turn his side and get away from the block of Brown, number 68, and then he goes and hits the ball carrier. Sure. Mac in the backfield, but Mac twists, and it's going to be close. Keith, you're right. Danny Ford isn't going to mess with it. He's just about a yard short of his first down. Well, Clemson defense has been too strong against the Georgia offense to take any chances. Keep Georgia backed up. Field position is the most underrated thing by the fans. Coaches don't overrate it, but fans overrate the value of Georgia having the ball on their own 10 or 15 yard line. Let's see now if Dale Hatcher can kill it deep. No pressure. Jimmy Harrell back on the 15, fair catch, Georgia's ball. First down at the 15. That was a 33-yarder, but again, the distance of a punt does not always define its effectiveness. Monday Night Football premieres for its 13th season. Next Monday night, Pittsburgh and Dallas. 9 Eastern time, 8 Central. The Pittsburgh Steelers and the Dallas Cowboys. And that's a rivalry that rattles the chandeliers across the country. I'll never forget the Super Bowl when those teams played. One of the greatest football games I've ever seen. Pittsburgh finally winning into the ball game. Now the Bulldogs got their goal line at their back. Last thing occurs, gives it off to his fullback. Herschel Walker is uh, not in there. Carney Norris is the tailback. Once again, Wayne Ratliff, the Georgia center, six foot five, is blocking on 320 pounds. Yes, 320 pounds. Son of a uh, nose guard, Perry. Watch the tie he gets, but he keeps his feet going. That's a tremendous effort because Ratliff knocked him back and got him leaning back in his own backfield. Barry Young, the fullback. Norris, the tailback. 
Uh -oh. Goes to Norris. He's hit behind the line of scrimmage, but gets a little something out of it. And that time, Mr. Perry almost got it. Mr. Uh, Payne moved over to the nose, go to the guard's gap, and shot the gap, and Georgia didn't pick him up. He's getting a little rest. The Payne's coming back in the ball game. The Bruce Brothers, nose guards, Princeton University. Ball is at the 20-yard line of Georgia. It is third down and five. see the defense is really dominating by both teams. Outstanding defense, about what we expected in the early goings. Last finger on a roll right. Finish. And the pass is complete on the sidelines to Chuck Jones. It's not enough for a first down. No. Andy Hedden, number 12, was heading him off over there, and he unloaded it to the short man Jones. And he's now better part of four yards short of his first down. So back in comes Jim Broadway to punt again. And Billy Davis will go deep for Clemson. I believe that was the first pass that the Georgia quarterback last thing has completed in the ball game. That's his second. It his second. Broadway hits a bullet. Davis fair catch back at the Clemson 39. Good punt by Jim Broadway. And so the Tigers still have good field position. They've had the better edge in that so far in the ball game. We're all even at seven. Sanford Stadium, 82,122. It is the largest football crowd the Clemson Tigers have ever played before. The previous biggest was their 82,000 in the 1959 Super Bowl game. First down for Clemson at their own 39. 7-7 ball game at 5-16 to go in the first half. Homer Jordan stands up, throws to Stockstill. And Stockstill gets planted by Ronnie Harris. Stockstill. It's a great play by Ronnie Harris. He was had one-on-one -on -one coverage. He gave very little cushion. The emphasis in pass defense is changing direction. And boy, when he planned that foot to come up, he searched Mike Wood and held him to a minimum game. Max Wayne looking for a hole. There isn't one. Lost a yard. It's exactly what the Georgia defense can do so well. When they get you, when they get themselves in trouble on second and two, they go to their blitz, shoot every gap, penetrate, and are successful with it. Tackling the South Carolinian that made that play defensively for Georgia, Kenneth Sims out of Greenville. Remember a name, Kenneth Sims, that big old horse in Texas? Uh -huh. Do we ever? Does <laughs> Arkansas remember and everyone yeah. in the Southwest Conference? It's third down and five. Alley going in motion. Gordon rolling that way to the side wide side of the field. Homer looking for some daylight and can't get it. And Sims again makes the tackle for the Georgia Bulldogs. So that'll bring up fourth down and about three. Georgia has changed their defensive strategy from last year. And looking at the film, Jordan could get outside of containment and turn up field to either run or throw. They, Georgia defense has not allowed Jordan to get outside. He has for, they forced him to pull up too quickly to make any yardage. All right, Hatcher's in the punt again. He hits it from his 35. Hangs it up there for Harrell. Harrell calls fair catch. He's still pinned inside the 20, though. He puts it down at the 19. Right now, let's go to Ann Simon on the sideline and talk to Buck Ballou, the man who pulled the trigger so successfully for the Bulldogs, and get a reaction from Buck. Thank you, Keith. Buck, you of all people ought to know why is this Georgia offense sputtering so much? Well, number one, it's the first game of the year, and uh, Clemson's got an awesome defense, and they're playing really well right now. You just have to be patient. Hope, hopefully something open up for us on offense, but uh, this time, they're playing really good defense, and uh, we just I guess it's a battle of who makes the least amount of mistakes, and it doesn't look like there's been too many mistakes except for the two that uh, put the points on the board. Okay, Buck, thank you very much. Back to you, Keith. All right, in and off. Tron uh, Jackson is in there, and Jackson moves it. Or two. Georgia wants to be very careful with the ball right here. Coming up on the three minutes left in the half, tie ball game. They've got a new start after giving Clemson an early touchdown with the fumble. Second down and eight. Lastinger trying to read it down the line and 
Clemson gets him right about the line of scrimmage. And again, Kenneth Sims is in there, number 57, along with Roy Brown, number 47. The Clemson defensive strategy, as I said earlier, is to throw the offense back if possible. Their tackles are coming on the inside shoulder tackles. Their ends are penetrating. Their nose man is penetrating and trying to force the plays wide and possible loss with a back supporting fans. There are the numbers so far. Third and eight. Last finger looking to throw it. Got nobody to throw it to. He uh, sent number 20, Kevin Harris, deep, and Vandell Arrington was covering him like a blanket. And by the time he turned to look to the other side of the field to see if he had anybody else to choose, uh, William Devane was on him. Well, Georgia used a play-action pass on third and ten, and Clemson was not fooled. Their linebackers were seven or eight yards deep, and they picked up the tight end in the back out of the backfield. Nothing there for Lester. Broadway in the punt. This will be his sixth punt in the ball game. Out of a knuckleball. Billy Davis feels it, trying to get a little daylight to run it. Can't do it, but again, Clemson has good field position. The ball's going to be out around the 42. 34-yard punt. This is what we have for you at halftime. Jim Lampley, Jack Whitaker, and Beano Cook, who will be involved with our pre-game and our post-games on college football today. We'll have highlights of some Saturday's uh, games for you. We'll have an interview with Herschel Walker, and we'll have highlights of this first half. Ball is on the 42. Homer Jordan still got it. He had Magwood for a moment. Now the door closes there, and he delivers the ball short to Jeff McCall, the fullback, swinging out of the backfield, and he gets about seven or eight yards. He moves it from the 42 up near midfield. A bootleg pass really holds the linebackers on first down. He fakes to Austin going up the middle, but the judgment. Here is where uh, Jordan is so good. He hesitates, he runs, he hesitates, and he finally finds a fullback back open and hits him for a nice gain of eight yards, nine yards. Terry Hogue knocks him out, second down and two. Stock still in motion. Jordan rolls it the other way, wants to throw it, gets it off. And it is incomplete. He was looking at Magwood, and he really was, uh, if he decided to throw it away, he made a good decision because Magwood had red shirts on both sides of it. Georgia has changed. I I'm very impressed with the Georgia defense and the adjustments that they have made in defensing Homer Jordan, the quarterback of Clemson, uh, from last year. They've changed their strategy. They now have two men coming from outside on the rollout, giving their defensive backs a better chance to cover their receivers. Jordan does, does not have the time to choose his uh, receivers. Third down and about two. Or Clemson of midfield. Gives the ball to Austin. And Austin gets the first down for Clemson at the Georgia 47. Brought down by Will Forts. Linebacker for the Bulldogs. There's the time remaining. A minute and 26 seconds to play in the first half. A 7-7 ball game. Now, Clemson can pick up one more first down with time running out here in the first half. They're going to be in field goal range. I'm sure that's their game plan. They've told their, their team and the quarterback, Jordan, will step in the huddle and say, men, if we can make one first down, we've got a chance to go out with a lead at halftime. Minute 35 to go in the first half. Jordan back, looks for Magwood, goes short over the middle. Pass is incomplete. Clemson screaming for pass interference. K.D. Dunn had come across the tight end over the middle. Will Forts, number 42, Keith, really picked him up. That's excellent play. One of the toughest things to defend in the back uh, is a short pass to the tight end, but Will Forts changes directions beautifully, reacts, and watch him come up. Number 42. And he could have been interference. He did make contact just before the ball got there. Very close. Second down and 10. Ball just short of the Georgia 47. getting a little heat now. Gets his pass off. It's intercepted. Tony Flack picks it off. And it's Georgia's ball down at the 40. So the freshman comes up with a big play. The fre freshman, Tony Flack, 
from North Carolina made a great play, but the reason for the interception, watch Jimmy Payne to the right of your screen. We'll be calling his, watch 87, play off the block. He's a defensive tackle. Now he's chasing Jordan, makes him throw the ball off balance, and Flack, the freshman, catches that ball and makes a nice rain. All right, the Georgia Bulldogs stopped Clemson's bid for at least three points in the closing moments of the first half. Bulldogs have it back at their own 40. Last thing is going to drop and throw, and he goes deep. And it's intended for Norris Brown, and it is incomplete. And there's good coverage downfield by Arrington for Clemson. Norris Brown, number 88, has, as Keith has already mentioned, the most speed of any Georgia receiver. The Clemson backs are really treating the Georgia receivers with contempt. I don't believe that, that uh, either uh, Jones or Harris, the wide receivers of Georgia, have the speed to go deep. And therefore, the cornerbacks are not honoring their threat and are covering those short passes. We'll yeah. Second down and 10 now with a minute and 12 seconds to play in the first half. That's Tron Jackson in motion. Ball goes to him. He doesn't hang on to it. Trying to run before he got a handle. Jeff Suttle, number 23, was over there. As we look at Vince Dooley, in his 19th year at the University of Georgia, the athletic director, as well as the head football coach, has, for the last 10 years, served as chairman of the Ethics Committee of the American Football Coaches Association, now serves on the Board of Trustees, and will eventually be president of the American Football Coaches Association. Quite a man, quite a gentleman, quite a football coach. Charles Jr., number 80, is in now. Senior out of Waycross. Going for as much speed as they can get. Last stinger. Gets his pass off over the middle. It goes to Junior. And Junior gets out of bounds, stopping the clock at 57 seconds to play. Harrington was back there chasing him. But once Charles Junior got his hands on the ball, all he wanted was a sideline. There is a great effort by Junior getting deep in the middle, and he reacts to the scramble by Last Finger. The ball is right on target. That's what Last Finger needed to scramble, hit the receiver, make a nice game, fire up his football team, and get in full field goal range if they can't score. And Butler has this kind of range. First down. The ball is at the Clemson 33. Last Finger rolls and throws. Pass is complete to Scott Williams, the fullback. And Williams takes the ball inside the 25 to the 23. Time remaining there. Timeout call. Clemson man, Terry. Uh, and Jeff Suttle uh, shaken up on the play. And Keith, they're going to measure to see if it's a first down. This will keep the clock stopped a little bit longer, and Georgia can get the play called out of the huddle and get up the line of scrimmage and be ready to go if they would. They've got time for two plays in the kick. They have uh, at least two plays. 43 seconds. And we asked our statistician how many timeouts does Georgia have left? Two timeouts left. Well, that's what it says on the board, doesn't it? One. Subtle will leave. Jeff was shaken up. He was involved in the tackle on Williams. And they put the ball down. You're going to see they're just short of a first down. Less than a yard. About a half a yard. So fortune has swung swiftly here on the Tony Flack interception as Homer Jordan tried to force it. Georgia's right up the line of scrimmage. As soon as the officials start the clock, Georgia will be in position to snap the ball, thus saving time. And the ball off to Tom Jackson. And Jackson trying for the first down. That'll stop the clock again with 31 seconds, 30 seconds. It's still running. Georgia got one time out remaining. Yes, so now they stop it. They'll probably bring the change back. 26 seconds on the clock. One time out for Georgia. The clock will stay uh, in a stop position until the referee signals whether it's a first down or not and gets the change back over to the boundary. Georgia should call their play, get up the line of scrimmage, and be ready to run the play and save as much time as possible. They still have the timeout. 
So they can run another play, call a time, and then settle in for their kick, and they're still just short. So it'll be third down, and about a foot and a half. Twenty-six seconds, they're going to play, and then I think we'll see Kevin Butler. Set the ball up to the right, directly in front of the goalpost, and make the kick e even easier for Kevin Butler, who was all Southeastern Conference freshman kicker last year. They go to the tailback, trying to get the first down again, and the clock is now running at 13, and stops at 13. Ron Jackson, the tailback. I guess they ran to the left because of the, the size of Jimmy Harper, the left tackle at 275, and Mike Weaver, the left guard at 275. But it didn't put the ball in position, for, uh, better position for the field goal. Well, he's a sidewinder. So he's got a natural hook on it. I'll tell you one thing, the Bulldogs are playing that clock like a harp. Timeout when Georgia couldn't get their defense lined up has been very, very disadvantageous to them. They're still short of the first half. Now it's down to about uh, six inches. And here comes Butler. They've got to call time out or they won't get the play all. That's right. They've got 13 seconds. The field goal team is out there. Jim Broadway to hold it and Kevin Butler to kick it. And now I think George is going to call the time. They do. So, with the score 7 7, 13 seconds remaining in the first half of play, the Georgia Bulldogs have a chance for a 39 yard field goal. Clemson University Tigers, the 1981 National Football Champions. You'll be hearing more from them in the coming years. You'll also be hearing more about Clemson University's high standards of academic excellence. It's nine colleges, outstanding faculty, bright, well-prepared students. Clemson Tigers, Clemson graduates. You'll be hearing more from number one. Jim Broadway will take the snap, put the ball down at the 29, making it a 39-yard field goal try. The Clemson Tigers, on the other hand, want to put as much pressure on sophomore Kevin Butler as they possibly can so they retaliate by calling a timeout themselves. They want to let the old cooker heat up <laughs> on Kevin. Well, let's talk about Kevin Butler. As a freshman last year, he kicked 37 out of 38 extra points in the regular season, and he had 19 out of 26 field goals. As a very strong and accurate leg, the Georgia coaches have great confidence, which we've already seen with that, uh, what, 59-yard field goal attempt uh, with eight minutes left to go on the clock. It looked like it was going to be Clemson going for the three-pointer until Flack steps. And then Lastinger hit Junior. And Junior made a big play out of it. And since that time, uh, when Junior went out of bounds, there was 57 seconds to play, and the Bulldogs have really played the clock. Now with 13 ticks remaining, Butler will go for it from 39 yards. Three-man effort, a good snap, good hold, and a good kick. Three-man team effort. 82,000 plus coming up to watch it. It's plenty long. It's good. kid is impervious to pressure. He doesn't understand the word. Georgia <laughs> takes the lead 10 to 7 with nine seconds to play. Well, the butler did do it, didn't he? Yes, he did. Boy, it's a great sense of security to have a kicker like Butler. When you get stopped, you can expect to come out with three points and a lead in a ball game and go in at halftime 
in that dressing room the three points back Saturday these are the games we have for you highlighted by the USC Florida opening game for the Southern California Trojans second game for the Gators who took a close win over the Miami Hurricane you some of you'll be watching Miami in Houston it'll be the opener for the Houston Cougars Bill Yeoman's team also the opener for Michigan against Illinois and Illinois scored 49 in their opener and Virginia Navy both opening the season those are regional games coming up next Saturday here on ABC the kickoff coming up now with nine seconds to play in the first half with Kevin Mack and Chuck McSwain the deep people for the white shirted Tigers of Clemson with only nine seconds on the clock I would expect Butler to kick it on the ground uh, maybe to one of the linemen to the one of the backs up backs well he kicks it so far uh, that uh, they're seldom returned and there is no return on this one he is Clemson has not been able to return a kickoff so far tonight so we've still got nine seconds to play as the Tigers come up to their 21st down. Keith, all the three touchdowns have really been set up by offensive uh, mistakes. Mm -hmm. A fumble by Georgia, 11-yard touchdown, a block kick uh, on Clemson for a touchdown, an intercepted pass uh, by freshman uh, Tony Flack uh, for Georgia setting up their field goal. They're going to run it out. the clock run off. So the first half is over here in Athens, Georgia. And the score, Georgia 10, Clemson 7. <laughs> Mistakes, opening opportunities. And with Coach Vince Dooley's team leading, let's visit with him as Ann Simon talks to him. Georgia is up by three, but Blastinger has had some problems. Are you happy with his performance so far? Well, our whole offense has had some problems. I think, first of all, it's a credit to Clemson's defense, but also I think we're partly responsible for it. And maybe uh, maybe we'll settle down a little bit in the second half. We've got to move the ball and got to make a few first downs if we're going to have a chance in this ball game. Any plans on changing your quarterback by chance? No, no, we'll stick with John, and I think maybe after the first half, maybe he'll get a little bit more... Uh, relax in the second half. I hope so anyway. You brought Herschel in. It looked like you tried to surprise Clemson. Well, we did, except we made a, an error. At least the official saw an error, and it cost us a touchdown. Uh, but uh, who knows what will happen in the second half. Okay, thanks, Coach. Thank you. Back to you, Keith. All right, Ann. NCAA College Football, Clemson and Georgia, will continue here on ABC after this message from our local station. This is the pregame, part of the halftime, and the postgame. The way we're presenting the game this year on ABC television. And our co-hosts are Jack Whitaker and Jim Lampley. Since they're here, let's put them to work. Go ahead, guys. Thank you very much, Keith. Yes, uh, Jim and I will be with you on the pregame show, halftime, and the postgame all throughout the rest of this college season. We'll be bringing you highlights from games around the country as fast as we can and as accurately as we can, all the scores. We'll bring you some uh, feature stories, some editorials, and essays. And on those latter points, Jim, you've been working on a story now for almost a year, haven't you? Yes, Jack. I'm concerned about a problem that has to do with the ongoing NCAA investigation of Clemson, which Keith and Frank referred to at the top of the telecast. Many of us who cover NCAA sports believe that one of that organization's thorniest problems in enforcement and a source of some unfairness to the schools is the excessive length of time it sometimes takes to complete an investigation and reach a verdict, in some cases as much as three years. Now use Clemson as an example. Newspapers first began reporting that Clemson was under the NCAA microscope as far back as April of 1981. At that time, details of some of the charges against them became publicly known and were widely reported. We covered the story on ABC Sports last November. Of course, the irony was that Clemson's great success on the football field only focused more attention on their problem with the NCAA. And during that time, the university was cooperating with the NCAA investigation and not in a position to defend itself publicly. Finally, in July of this year, 14 months after the first headlines, the NCAA presented Clemson with a notice of official inquiry. At that time, Clemson asked for an extension of time to reply to the charges. The affair drags on. No verdict yet, 
No telling when one is forthcoming. Meanwhile, Clemson football can't escape from the stigma. Example, a lengthy article about Clemson in the New York Times this morning. Several paragraphs devoted to discussion of the NCAA investigation, the charges of illegal recruiting, the specter of a possible penalty. The simple fact is that even if the NCAA were to find Clemson innocent tomorrow, the school has already been penalized by 17 months of rumor, innuendo, and bad publicity. And I'm not the only person who thinks this is a problem. One man who agrees with me is the chairman of the very committee which will decide the case, the NCAA Infractions Committee. His name is Charles Allen Wright, Texas law professor. I talked with him Friday. I think that is the greatest single defect in NCAA procedure, that often our cases do drag. But isn't it fair to guess that when an investigation takes an extremely long period of time, there is encouragement to presume guilt regardless of what verdict you might reach? It is undoubtedly true that many institutions are hurt simply because for a year or more, the, the press in their area and the coaches from other institutions were recruiting against them were saying, oh, you know Siwash is under an NCAA investigation. You don't want to go there. They'll be on probation the years that you're there. And that undoubtedly is hurtful. It doesn't seem to me that you violate the confidentiality principle if you refer to a particular case where it is publicly known that an investigation is taking place. So I ask you, isn't this a problem in the Clemson case, the length of the investigation? It clearly is. Clemson announced that uh, they were under investigation, so I can confirm that that is so. And Clemson also announced on July 1st that they had requested and our committee had granted an extension of time for them to respond to the inquiry. Uh, my committee can't hear the case until Clemson has responded. And in the case of Clemson, hasn't the length of that investigation irreparably harmed that institution's reputation? I don't know that it's irreparable. I, I agree that, that they certainly have been harmed. Well, we hope to have pieces of journalism like that every week on college football today. Another feature, as we mentioned, would be highlights of other games. Now, obviously, the only game being played on this Labor Day is the one we're watching, Clemson to Georgia. But college football kicked off their 1882 season this weekend, and we have highlights from three of those more dramatic games, and they will form the nucleus of tonight's Fireman's Flashback. Now, today's Fireman's Fund Flashback is brought to you by Fireman's Fund Insurance. And Fireman's Fund Insurance is brought to you by an independent agent or a broker near you. At Gainesville, Florida, it was Florida and Miami. Florida quarterback Wayne Peace, 18 of 20 for 220 yards, scored the game's first touchdown on a four-yard roll around the right end. Score, 7-0. Miami struck back on its next possession, the touchdown on a six-yard pass from quarterback Jim Kelly to Glenn Dennison. The score, 7-7. Following a field goal, Florida led at half, 10-7. Miami took its only lead of the game when Mark Rush dove in from the one-yard line, 14-10. The winning touchdown was scored with one minute and 48 seconds left in the game. Peace threw to James Jones, who made a one-handed catch falling into the end zone. The final score, 17 to 14. In Knoxville, it was Duke against Tennessee and quarterback Bob Bennett of Duke, who hit on 18 of 29 for 288 yards, hooked up with Chris Casker on the longest touchdown pass in Duke history. 88 yards. Trailing 24-12 with less than a minute left in the third quarter, Greg Boone of Duke took this kickoff halfway in the end zone. And with some judicious blocking and a tremendous burst of speed down the right sideline, he rambled 100 yards for a touchdown. Duke scored another TD and then held off the Volunteers and won a thriller 25 to 24. Jackie Sherrill made his coaching debut at Texas A&M against Boston College. Quarterback Doug Flutie of Boston College scored the Eagles' second TD himself, rolling around the left end from eight yards out. Flutie threw for three TDs, completed 18 of 26 passes for 356 yards, as BC defeated Texas A&M 38 to 16. We'll return here to Athens, Georgia, for more football in just a moment. College football is beginning its 113th season. 
in addition to presenting the excitement of outstanding athletic competition during the next 14 weeks, the NCAA will feature a series of messages about many of the interesting academic curriculums available to you as offered by our nation's colleges. Hello, I'm Dr. James Frank, president of Lincoln University and president of the NCAA. The theme of this series is America's energy is mind power, which will provide a unique opportunity to show the tremendous contribution that higher education is making toward the betterment of American life. Curriculums ranging from astronomy to forestry and geology to marine studies will provide a unique flavor of the opportunities available to prospective students pondering a career. The NCAA would like to salute the Council for Advancement and Support of Education, 30 national and 87 state education associations and agencies for sponsoring National Higher Education Week, October the 2nd through the 9th. This nationwide campaign promoting higher education will climax Saturday, October the 9th with a national convocation at the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. As a college president, I am privileged to witness the tremendous contributions that faculty, staff, and students are making toward the advancement of knowledge. The NCAA would like for you to enjoy the excitement of college football and gain a greater appreciation for higher education during the telecast this fall. America's energy is mind power. The preceding message provided by the NCAA. Earlier this summer, Jim Lampley had a chance to sit down and have a nice quiet chat with Herschel Walker. Herschel, you are always a person who produces some great quotes. I'd like just to go over a few of the recent ones I've read, which are unusual, and ask for your explanation. Some of these come right out of the morning paper. Quote, uh, might not accept the Heisman Trophy if I win it this year. Did you say that? <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I said that uh, I don't think the Heisman going to mean anything to me. Uh, a lot of people write what I don't say. They put it in their own words, and I think uh, a lot of things I've been saying have been done like that. And what I'm saying here is uh, if I win the Heisman this year, it's going to be like they're giving it to me because they feel sorry for me. I don't want anyone to give me anything. I think I should earn what I get, and that's what's going to help me to be a better player. Just from a philosophical standpoint, do you think there's any validity to the idea that writers and broadcasters can sit down and pick one man as the very best college football player, or is it a charade? Well, I think it's a charade because uh, I think most people vote for people in their area. And uh, I think the thing is, is you can't sit down and say he's the best athlete around because there are some good linemen who never get their name in the lights or anything. It's hard to just pick one athlete out of the, at least out of a thousand of athletes. Quote number two, Herschel. I don't know if I'll play pro football when that time comes. Yes, that's, I say that because uh, I could do a lot of things besides play pro football or besides, I think I'm a person that can do many things and be successful at it. And when I came into football, it wasn't my sport. It was something I liked to do, but it wasn't something that I was at least happy. Uh, right now, I'm getting where I like to play, but then it's not my game. I love running and I love basketball, and uh, I think I can go into the business world and be just successful. This past spring, a great deal was written and said about the possibility that you might challenge the NFL draft and attempt to become eligible to play in the NFL but you decided to stay here. Does that mean that you're now committed to playing two more years of football here at Georgia? Oh, I never commit myself to anything. And uh, the thing that I did last year, a lot of people written it up wrong, or they wrote it up wrong, sorry. But uh, the thing was, was that I said that I think the rule was unconstitutional. And I said that I was gonna challenge the rule, but I never said I was gonna play NFL ball. And a lot of people said Hershey's challenging the rule to play NFL ball, and that's, that wasn't true. I wanted to really change because I wanted my option. I wanted to do what I felt was right, and I wanted to do it. At least I want to have the opportunity to have to say so in my life because I think everyone owes that to themselves to have to say so in their life. I think you can probably tell that Herschel is studying criminal justice at the University of Georgia. <laughs> Score at halftime, Bulldogs 10, Clemson Tigers 7. 
And let's now take a look at some of the highlights out of the first half. And though it's a low-scoring ball game, there were some obvious moments born fundamentally out of mistakes. And let's begin with a fumble recovered by Clemson down on the Georgia 11-yard line. Keith, let me have this mic for just a minute, and let's hold and stop these highlights. And I want to tell the audience that before the ball game today, by official proclamation of the governor of Georgia, the mayor of Athens, that today was Keith Jackson Day. In appreciation for his distinguished service as a sportscaster, and in particular, the prestige and honor that you have brought to college football in these 10 years that you have served us as the voice of college football. Keith, as your colleague and friend and fellow Georgian, we're proud of you. It's a great honor. Thank you, Frank. I was a bit taken aback for it. I never know quite how to act about these things. I guess I could just say all oh, shucks and forget it, but I did enjoy it, and it was a great pleasure and always a pleasure to come home because this is both of our home states, and it was a pleasure. I'm sure you don't want to hear any more about that. Let's get back to the, <laughs> the highlights of the ball game because uh, it was a mistake by the Georgia offense here. Last thing, they're losing uh, the snap from center, and uh, big number 66 comes in there like a fallen tree and comes down on top of the ball, and that sets up uh, one of the more exciting moments as Homer Jordan did a dance into the end zone. It was a great call. The quarterback draw is one of the toughest plays to defense because the linemen are rushing the pass. They're trying to get depth, and they take themselves right out of the play, as you can see. And Homer Jordan, who has great quickness and speed, jumps right into the end zone for the go-ahead touchdown. Now, a mistake here. As Clemson, see the man, Clemson man back there to block, he doesn't pick up Dale Carver at all. Carver comes in untouched from the defensive end position, blocks the ball, number 50, Stan Dooley, then comes across and picks up a touchdown. The, the, that was just a uh, mental mistake by uh, the Clemson fullback. He should have turned out. He has the option to block anybody, but Stan Dooley was right there, and he gets credit for a two-yard punt return and a touchdown. Now, it looked like here in the closing moments of the first half, Clemson might get in field goal range, but Homer Jordan tries to force one and is picked off, and it's Georgia that winds up with a field goal. He was under pressure by number 87, uh, Jimmy Payne, but the freshman from North Carolina, number eight, Tony Black makes an outstanding play, makes enough of a return to give Georgia good field position, and with two pass completions by John Lastinger, they set up a 39-yard field goal by Kevin Butler to go out at halftime with a lead of 10 to 7. All right, now we saw Herschel Walker briefly. We saw him used as the decoy. Uh, first off, let me ask you if you think Herschel will play in the second half. I think that Vince will keep him on the bench. I would until he is needed desperately. They've gotten the lead with their quarterback lasting and not doing very well, Keith. And they are back in the ball game, and I think that they'll be conservative here, let Clemson continue to make mistakes and maybe win the ball game on Clemson's help. Well, now, Clemson's got to open up a little more, it seems to me. Very much. I definitely believe Clemson has got to open up with uh, Jordan, a good passer. He needs to use that weapon. All right, that's where we are at halftime. We're about ready to go with the second half. A big moon hanging over Sanford Stadium, and the score, Georgia 10, Clemson 7. NCAA College Football, Clemson versus Georgia. This ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud for you. By Mr. Goodwrench and General Motors Parts, who help you keep that great GM feeling with genuine GM parts. And by Sears Roebuck and Company. For quality merchandise, wide selection, fair prices, and dependable service, you can count on Sears. In 1785, America's first state university was established in Georgia. After two centuries, the University of Georgia has educated more than 150,000 students, is a leader in programs of direct service to the public, and is ranked as one of the nation's top 50 research universities. In 1985, its bicentennial will find the University of Georgia, the nation's oldest chartered state university, prepared to begin its third century of service to the people. who has pursued college football for the last 25 years with a passion that defies description. Bino thinks that college football is our number one national treasure. He also is possessed of very strong opinions, which fortunately for all of us who have known him, he's not afraid to share. And tonight, I think you want to talk about those people who think there's parody in big-time college football, Bino. Pure propaganda. We first heard 
that parity was going to happen in 1974 when they started giving 30 scholarships a year. And every school would be equal then with the 30 scholarships. That's right. Somebody cannot bring in six halfbacks. They only can bring in two or three. That has not happened. The same teams that dominated before the scholarship rule are still dominating and will conti continue to dominate. In the last eight years, 64 appearances in the four major bowls. Seven teams, 33 of those 64 appearances, and that doesn't include Notre Dame. Why is this, do you think? Why do the same schools remain on top? Well, it would happen because of the exposure to television, the, the tradition. Take Vanderbilt. The only way Vanderbilt would get to the Sugar Bowl is if the other nine teams in the conference go in probation. And it isn't going to change. Oregon State has not gone to the Rose Bowl since the 60s. Oregon or California since the 50s for the Rose Bowl. It's tough to catch up. You think parity is a good thing, something we ought to be trying for? I think parity would be the greatest. I would like to see Northwestern go to the Rose Bowl. I would like to see these other teams win. We're not going to see it in our lifetime. Why not? just won't happen. It's the facts of college football that the powers will continue to dominate, even at 30 scholarships a year. Even if you went to 20 scholarships a year, it would still be that way. Thank you very much, Bino. We look forward to seeing you next Saturday on College Football Today. And we'll return to Athens, Georgia for the second half of the Clemson-Georgia game in just a moment. The city of Georgia Bulldogs will kick off to the Clemson Tigers to start the second half of play, with Georgia leading by a score of 10 to 7. The deep people are Kevin Mack and Chuck McSwain for Clemson. Kevin Butler hits it. He sails it to the end zone. So still, Clemson has not been able to return a kickoff. Now let's have a look at the big guys who will play defense. And here's a guy who really had a big half for the Bulldogs. Jimmy Payne, also a big first half at tackle. Jack Lindsay, a defensive guard. Tim Crow, 235-pound guard, and Stan Dooley, who got the touchdown after Carver had blocked the kick. Tommy Thurston is a linebacker. Will Forts is the other starting linebacker. And we'll show you the secondary in a moment. As Homer Jordan lines him up. Cliff Austin, number seven. And Jeff McCall. And they'll try it on the ground on the first play, and the Georgia defense looks like it's come out steaming here to start the second half. The secondary for the Georgia Bulldogs, Ronnie Harris, a junior college transfer last year, Tony Flack, who had the big interception in the first half, Terry Hogue, who's playing a rover back, big Texas fella, and Jeff Sanchez, who transferred in from junior college out of Yorba Linda, California. He might have followed in J.C. It'll be second down and nine for Clemson from their own 21. Pretty noisy place with 82,122. Homer Jordan gives to the trail back Austin, and Austin gets around the corner, gets up to the 30, and that will be a first down for the Clemson Tigers, brought down by Ronnie Harris. The offensive unit for Clemson, Jordan at quarterback, Austin the tailback, McCall at full, Magwood the flanker, and Stockstill to split in. Big guys up front are Brown, Farr, Massaro, Butcher, Mayberry, and Diggs with K.D. Dunn getting some playing time at tight end as well. Neither quarterback particularly successful in the ball game. The combination of being very conservative and strong defense. Homer Jordan, 5 out of 11 for only 31 yards, but two interceptions. On the first down play, he gives the ball to McCall. McCall's got the better part of five as he falls across the 35. So it'll be second down and five. And the biggest play in the ebb and flow of a college football game is almost always the first down play because it opens up so many opportunities for you. But opportunities, as you can see from these numbers in the first half, Frank, were frittered away. They certainly were. They, they, neither offense showed very much imagination, and that's to be expected in the first ball game. Defense is dominated. The big play, the turnovers, three by Clemson and one by Georgia. Second down and five from the 35. Jordan gives it again to Austin. Austin over the right side, running between the center and the right guard, brought down by Tim Crow, a defensive lineman in the middle. And they list him here at Georgia as a guard. Big fella out of Stone Mountain. The ball is just short of the 39. It'll be third down and two. A third down situation to the pass. Jordan, the quarterback, is taking the ball wide and has not been successful. Crowd really 
making noise now as Jordan calls a long count, gives to Cliff Austin. Austin cannot get the first down. The Georgia defense read it perfectly and came up and made a hit that really stuck. Ronnie Harris, number 27, and Nate Taylor, number 47. Any coach who's ever worked on defense would appreciate the play by Ronnie Harris out of junior college a year ago. Watch him come up to the outside and stick Cliff Austin, the tailback, right on the numbers and stop him short of the first half. Dale Hatcher is in the punt now. Gets his kick away. Jimmy Harrell drifting under it. Going to try to return one. And he is unable to. He runs laterally for about four steps, but he stopped on about the 24. Joe Glenn is the defensive end for the Clemson Tigers. Dan Finish is a big tackle. Played well in the first half. William Perry is that 320-pounder in the middle. Ray Brown weighs in at 231. He's out of Rome, Georgia. Andy Hedden had a good first half playing defensive end for the Tigers. The linebackers are Johnny Rimbert and Danny Triplett. Georgia's ball, first down at their own 24. John Lastinger at quarterback. And Lastinger is going to put it up on the first play. And he drills it. And no, it's loose. Clarence K gets loose. Big play. The tight end is finally out of bounds down inside the Clemson 25. When you see this again, it's a great throw. But what I want to talk about is Clarence King. The Georgia coaches tell me he's the most physical player on the Georgia football team. He's a tight end. He weighs 230, and you can see why they think that. He is physically tough. But now let's look at the timing. Four fifth step, rifles the ball, and there is the physical attributes of Clarence King, number 84, big tight end of Georgia. And Herschel Walker is in the ball game at tailback and Walker has it and he bangs into the line and he goes for about three from the 23 down to about the 20 brought down by Joe Glenn so Walker's in again second appearance in the game his first carry of the game you can see the Georgia players are trying to tell their fans to be quiet That 51-yard pass run play from Lastinger to Clarence K setting up this opportunity for the Bulldogs. Second down and seven on the Clemson 20. And timeout called by the University of Georgia. That should help quiet the crowd down a little bit. Lastinger wants to talk to the coaches. 11.05 to go, third quarter. Mm. Heavyweight champ Michael Spinks puts his title on the line against fourth-ranked Johnny Davis. The WBA World Light Heavyweight Championship on ABC's Wide World of Sports returns September 18th. With a second down and seven at the Clemson 20. Herschel Walker has carried the ball for the first time in the game. He's now 38th on the NCAA career rushing ladder with 3,510 yards. Let's see if he gets it again. Nope, Lastinger rolls it out. Throws it back the other way. The pass is caught by the fullback, Scott Williams. And Williams is inside the five for the three. First and goal to go, Georgia. Lastinger's numbers are catching up, Frank. He's now six out of 11 for 108 yards. And believe me, his confidence look at the throw all the way back across the grain and Williams number 30 shows his running ability and gets down to the three. watch the block by Hershey Walker on the defense end. he's going to take his shoulder and just knock number 71 all conference Dan finish down on the ground first and goal to go the ball goes to Hershey and he is hit behind the line of scrimmage and it was a cornerback shooting through there run over Watson, the first time we've called his name tonight, and he makes a big play. And it, a big play it was indeed, because he tackled Herschel in the backfield. Losses back to the six, a loss of three yards on the play by Watson. Herschel Walker playing with that broken thumb. Didn't expect to play. 
Stinger still got it. He is brought down by Ronald Watson just short of the goal line. I'm going to tell you something. John Latzinger is a different player. You can see the quickness. He exercised the option of keep the, keeping the ball on that last play and darted. And I mean jump through the hole for a gain down to the, what, the one yard line. One yard. Yep. Ball sitting right on the one yard hash mark. in the end zone, but a penalty flag. Georgia put a man in motion, and the, the offensive linemen were a little bit too eager, it appeared, from this point. Georgia lost a touchdown earlier on a reverse by Tron Jackson because of holding. Now Georgia's going to have to come up with a big play. Third and six means it to... It's going to rely pretty much on Les Stinger making an outstanding play. Offside, Georgia. So there was movement inside. Keith, many times when you put a when the offensive team put a man in motion, it extends your snap count. And Georgia was so anxious to get the ball in the line, in the end zone, they knew Hershey could go over the top, and the line just a little anxious. 51 of that 70 yards is uh, involved in that one pass one play. Here's the call by Pete Williams. Red team jumped offside. But most of the first, first half down. yardage was on that scramble pass to Charles Jr. that set up the field goal. That's right. So the young man is coming of age. We are seeing the building of a quarterback right here for Georgia. Third and the and goal to go from the six. He comes back. His intended receiver falls down. Clarence K gets tangled up and falls down, and the pass drops incomplete. No interference. They just simply got tangled up there, and he lost his footing. He would have been open for the touchdown. This is the same pass that Georgia scored on Pittsburgh in the Sugar Bowl. The crossing in is the toughest pattern to cover on the goal line. Number 12, Heaton get, pushes him down with his left hand, and that is illegal. As you can see, he just Hayden head number 12 pushed him down and saved the touchdown. An official center with. right there looking at it, too. He got away with it. Yep. Butler now for the field goal try. He hits it. From the 13, it is good for 23 yards. And so Georgia build its lead now to 13 to 7. The penalty wipes off the touchdown. Clemson got away with a little bit of hanky-panky. We'll be back. Hello. We're ready for the kickoff. It's Georgia leading 13 to 7. And the crowd coming up as Butler lines them up. And the deep people for Clemson are Kevin Mack and Chuck McSwain. Bulldogs leading by six. And there still is not a return on a Butler kickoff. Let's go back now to the play where Clarence K runs into, or he's run into by Andy Hedden here. It's clearly interference. The only way number 12 and the head can avoid a touchdown is to use his hands. He turns and takes his left hand and pushes play down. He was beaten on the play. That was his only choice, and the official missed it, costing Georgia a possible touchdown, a first down on the one-yard line. Of course, Georgia had a touchdown and uh, went offside and lost it as a result of that. But that looks to me like clearly a foul. All right, Homer Jordan goes to the air. Pass for KD Dunn. Incomplete. He was popped out of bounds by Ronnie Harris. Boy, is Georgia fired up. Another fine play by Ronnie Harris, the left defensive quarterback. Gave very little cushion. Didn't worry about the deep pass and came up and just was right there for the play. Homer Jordan has not had the typical performance that he usually has. Second down and 10 from the 20-yard line for Hunter back this time and has time goes to his short man and it's McSwain out of the backfield for a first down up around the 33 yard line so Tigers get a little more real estate to work with now as Flack makes the tackle to Georgia I think the Clemson has now changed their strategy and since Homer Jordan the fine rollout quarterback Keith can't get outside he's throwing from the pocket using unlimited possibilities with five receivers and I think that's what they might have to go to to win this ball game 
right they flex the tight end done now wide toward the bottom of the picture he's got three wide he's changing the play at the line and he stays on the ground with it gives it off to the Kevin Mack the fullback he's from the 33 up to about the 35 second down and eight coming up you know the George the Clemson coaches know that this is a very important drive they've got to get something going, going. Georgia has the momentum they have the fans Clemson's playing on the road they need to move this ball down the field and have some success Jordan's going to have to do it dropping back throwing out of the pocket I believe to Mack. Mack bounces off one tackler and then Flack comes up to bring him down. He's going to be a couple of yards short of his first down. Well, you know something, we were talking earlier about Georgia not having the great speed with Lindsey Scott, for example, who's gone, who's graduated. Uh, Clemson doesn't have the Terry Tuttles or the Jerry Butlers anymore either. No, the, the, really the only uh, a fast wide receiving the ball game is Frank uh, Magwood of Clemson. He does have speed to get deep. And Timeout he... called here by Clemson. They want to talk. Two yards to go on third down with seven minutes and 35 seconds to play in the third quarter in Georgia leading 13 to 7. The Florida Gators led by sensational quarterback Wayne Peace plus other regional games. Another reason to watch NCAA college football Saturday on ABC. Two coming for the Clemson Tigers. The Clemson Tigers, who were the national champions in 1981, they're trailing by six points. And we're coming up at the halfway point, just past the halfway point on uh, this third quarter. They need a short yardage play here. They have not been successful on this type of circumstance against the Georgia defense. Third and two. And they're not successful here. As Georgia Berry, Kevin Mack. They tried to send him over the left side. They sent him right at the side where Jimmy Payne was. <laughs> I wouldn't run at Jimmy Payne. That's the last thing I would do. Clemson tried to move Georgia out with three wide receivers on third and two keys, a change from their regular strategy, and it didn't work. Georgia didn't nibble at all. They didn't fake, fake the fake. Hatcher to punt. A good one. Arrow watching it. Runs out of bounds to catch it. And they're going to mark him out. Outside the 20, up around the 24. On September 18, the first night game ever at Notre Dame Stadium, the Michigan Wolverines come calling against the Fighting Irish. Bo Schimbeckler's ball club and Jerry Faust. Faust trying to get things reordered at Notre Dame after slipping to five and six a year ago. It'll be at nine Eastern time Saturday night, September 18. All right, now Clemson's defense got to get their back up a little bit here. Georgia is on a roll right now. Last time, gives the ball to Herschel Walker. And he moves up across the 25 to the 26 for a couple of yards. So apparently after carrying the ball a couple of times and Bill Lewis the defensive coordinator for Georgia the man he's talking to is Terry Hogue the rover. Terry Hogue would know what he's saying. He has a great point average deep of three point eight eight five in genetics. He can understand it. Bill Lewis a great young coach. Second down and eight for Georgia. Blastinger fakes it to Walker rolls out loops a pass down the sidelines that is caught. Out of bounds up at the 45 yard line by Kevin Harris, number 20. It was play action. The fakes are Herschel Walker, throws some people in the Clemson secondary, and Harris was open. We talked about earlier that Herschel Walker draws a crowd. When the other tailbacks faked up there, the Clemson defense wasn't full, but here is patience by last thing of the quarterback. And he takes his time, he pulls up, and he puts the ball right on the money for the first down. Just short of the 45 yard line. Different looking quarterback for Georgia this half. That's Chuck Jones, number one in motion. Walker's got it. Puts it in his left hand. And they bury him after a couple of yards. 
Edgar Pickett, defensive end, a junior from Lexington, North Carolina, makes the play. And they're not going to give him anything. He actually moves it no more than six inches. got the ball and he's outside holding the ball in the right hand of course is something that's just, just going to get all the doctors terribly upset well Herschel had the ball in his left hand as you've already mentioned yes. and that makes it very difficult to cut back uh, and it's very dangerous to cut back with the ball in your left hand yes, because the, the defense will be coming from inside out and have a good shot at the ball let's see whether or not there was a procedure by Georgia or encroachment by Clemson on the penalty. Well, I tell you, they're making a longer discussion than I thought. I thought it was clearly that Clemson just uh, anticipated the wrong snap count. Marty Richards. Evidently, there's Richards. more to it than that. Call the university police. Don't be both sides, all sides. Illegal procedure against the red team. All sides against the white team. They're all set in foul. Well, we'll do it again. That's what all the talking was about. One official called it one way, other official called it another. Let's watch it again, see if we can determine. There is uh, Perry. He is offside. Now, Georgia could have moved the ball. I didn't see the center move the ball. Whatever, it's second down and 10. From the 45 for Georgia. Williams gets five as he goes to midfield. Wayne, this Wayne Ratliff is having a good time. Number 55, 6'5", 230. He's blocking on 300 pounds, 320 pounds. William Perry, who jumps to the right, guesses wrong. Ratliff just puts his shoulder pad right in that good come in, rolls him out of there. And he rolls back and makes the play. That's great second effort by William Perry. It is third down and four for Georgia. The ball near the Clemson 49. They blitz it. He gets the ball away to Chuck Jones. Jones has got a Georgia first down. So, last singer, under the pressure of a blitz, fires quickly to Jones, and Chuck takes it for the first down. As a coach, I would say this is the best play of the game for John Lastinger because the blitz was on and he threw immediately and he got the first down. He is coming on. The making of a quarterback. I think we're seeing it right now. And Georgia fans and players and coaches are very happy. At the Clemson 42, first down. Radloff wound up with the ball because Johnny was out of it. Uh, Lastinger was out of it. And, uh, Radloff felt it was loose and just sat out on it. Well, let's watch it again, see if we can tell. There should be zero deviation in this exchange. You work on it you, by repetition, and there's the ball on the ground. No, Lastinger comes no, right Lastinger did get it. Yeah. Second down, he gained about a yard and nine. Walker with it. Herschel Walker. Gets a first down at the Clemson 31. At about 10 yards. One thing that Herschel Walker does, he runs with his eyes. He is in no hurry to get through the line of scrimmage. And listen to these fans. Boy, that's got to make Herschel feel good. But Herschel runs anywhere across the line that he sees in old daylight. First down, Bulldogs just inside the Clemson 32. 320 to go, third quarter. Lastinger getting heat from the backside, gets his pass off. It is complete. It is caught by Charles Jr. They mark him at the 20, and that is another Georgia first down. 
There we, here we're going to see patience. We didn't see this in the first half. John Lestinger, he's going to take his time, read the defense, look at the tight end, and turn and throw the junior over on the boundary. Look how wide open junior is right on the boundary. The reason for that, Lestinger, Lestinger looked inside and looked the defense away. Impressive possession by Georgia. Walker hit behind the line of scrimmage. Never had a chance to really get started that time. Ray Brown was the first man to get to him, big number 72. I think our fans would, well, it's worth mentioning for them that John Latzinger in his three years at Georgia, one was redshirted, he's completed seven passes out of 18 going into this ball game. One touchdown and one interception. Herschel now six carries for 11 yards net. There was a loss on that play of two. Second down, 12. On a blitz. On a blitz. And it works. That's Tim Childers, who can be a wild man out there. Childers can firing in. He's the strong safety. He timed it beautifully. He disguised it while Les Singer was uh, calling his signals from the right of your screen. There's no way the left guard who is pulling out the block he can get there in time. Tim Childers tackles Let Singer for the loss. Now it's third and long yard. Third and 21. Junior in motion. Passes away and incomplete. Intended for Clarence K. McSwain, Rod McSwain defending. The way the rule on uh, on the pass situation this year reads, it must be a catchable pass. Well, McSwain gives very little cushion. That is a perfectly played defensive effort by McSwain because close to the goal line and the fact that Kay is a tight end, he did not give any cushion. He was right there for the play. And Butler is in. 48-yard field goal try. It is up. It is no good. He hooked it out. So Butler misses from 48 yards with a minute 34 to play in the third quarter, and it's still 13-7 Georgia. Apparently, the thumb is of no discomfort to the man. But I, again, would remind you, as I did in the preseason program, this is the same young fellow who played with a dislocated shoulder the whole second half against Notre Dame in the Sugar Bowl game. He's a, he's a willing fellow. From the 31, Homer Jordan goes short to Chuck McSwain, and he gets it out to about the 36, maybe the 37. Young Terry Hogue played that beautifully, Keith. He dropped off and uh, defended against the deep curl and uh, came up and made the tackle for a five-yard gain on the short run. Second down and five from the 37. Stockstill and Magwood are the wide people. Jordan now seven out of 14 with 49 yards. Not many yards. Homer on a roll. Gets it off to the sideline. Stockstill makes the catch. Good catch by Jeff Stockstill up at the 45. And it's a Clemson first down. Now the Tigers start to move it a little bit. And they're moving it through the air, which is what I think you're going to have to do against Georgia. The defense are crowding the run in a tight tackle six. Tackles and guards and linebackers are in right over that middle. You've got to throw the football against that defense. Clock running at 105 to go in the third quarter. Jordan hands the ball off inside. That's going to be another Clemson first down. Kevin Mack has 4-4 speed, but it's a draw play. Fake pass and run. As Jordan takes the ball back to Kevin Mack, number 20, look at the hole because Georgia was rushing the passer. Forts number 42 misses the play. But look, that's great coaching. Kevin Mack sees trouble coming up and puts both hands over the ball and makes the first down and still protects it. Bad news right here for Clemson. It's Frank Magwood, the wide receiver. 
Really the man of speed for the Tigers, and they're working on uh, either a knee or an ankle. It's a knee. Magwood, uh, Magwood is the best blocking of the wide receivers for Clemson. He's a tough, mentally tough youngster. And let's see how he did get injured. Here he is going down, knowing it's a draw play. He's looking to the inside, and now his feet go out from up under him. And look at the right knee. The right knee bent up under him. That can be serious. I hope that it's not. He is being now assisted off the field. Keith, I've seen that happen so many times when a uh, uh, player slips and that knee curls up under the body and the body fall, fell on top of the knee. So Magwood leaves the ball game. Uh, let's hope it's not serious because he's a fine young athlete and I know that Danny Ford and his people need him. Kendall Alley is listed behind him at the flanker spot. Clemson has looked good on this possession, mixing up the draw play and passing. First down, the ball at the Georgia 42. Homer Jordan. Outside it goes to Mack. He's inside the 40, and a ankle tackle at the 39 kept him from going much farther. Barry Hogue made that play. If he doesn't make that tackle, he's gone for some yardage. Coming up next Saturday, USC and Florida. It's in Gainesville. John Robinson and his folks are packing ice right now. Oh, that Florida looked great in the victory over Miami last Saturday. Charlie Fells bunch. The other games reflected there, you'll see in your area. Check your local listings for the games. As Jordan rolls out on second down and seven, Homer's quickness keeps it alive. He completes the pass to Stockstill, who loses his footing and falls down. And uh, Stockstill had some room. He might have been able to pick up a first down. But the third quarter is over. Georgia leading 13 to 7, and we will continue after this commercial message and the word from our local station. We're going to the final 15 minutes of the football game, the 51st meeting between Clemson and Georgia. And Georgia leads by 6, 13 to 7. Third down and 5 for Clemson at the Georgia 37. Jordan's pass is away. Double coverage, incomplete. The pass intended for Magwood, who had come back into the ball game. And Frank went as high as he could, trying to come down with it, but he had two men around him. Ronnie Harris, the left halfback, gives very little cushion. He's playing man for man. Watch him show up on your screen. Number 27. He goes over the top. He had man for man coverage, and he deflects the ball. Sanchez, the safety man, number 31, assisted. It's incomplete, and now Clemson has to punt the ball. Jimmy Harrell will go deep for Georgia, and Hatcher going to try to kill it deep. Low snap. Shoots it up in the air. They got a chance at this one. No, carries too far. It turned over on him. He was trying to spin it up there and let it come down tail first, but he wouldn't do it. And so Georgia takes over the ball, first down at its own 20, with 14.47 to play in the game. Remember, Clemson came in with the nation's longest winning streak and defending national champions. They won 13 in a row, and they won their national championship as a result of their victory over Nebraska in the Orange Bowl. I'll tell you somebody who's sitting watching this ball game with a great deal of interest tonight is a fellow named Lavelle Edwards, who brings his BYU Cougars in here next Saturday. He'll be watching every play. Junior goes in motion. Ball goes to Herschel Walker. And sticks his head in the crowd and gets a yard. Jim Scott. Number 67 met him in Stockton. Here are the stats for three quarters. You're going to see here that Georgia has really picked up. In fact, Clemson has picked up a little bit with their rushing. But Georgia with last finger having success, gaining confidence. He has now got Georgia moving with the football, and they now lead in, in first uh, in the yardage gain. Second down and 10 from the 20. <laughs> makes contact number 65 moved the yeah James Brown the right guard moved and Benny stepped in to make contact killed the play the flags flew and it should be a procedure against Georgia it's going to be offside I mean yeah. offsetting I think isn't it well the umpire did not see that watch the watch the right guard move yep 
See, he cannot move. The defensive man has the right to charge into the uh, neutral zone. Against the white team. Still oh. second down. I, he missed the call. He missed the call. I tell you that the defensive man can penetrate the neutral zone and get back. The offensive guard is restricted. He cannot move. Eight, six to five move. Now here we go. On second down and five. Safety blitz. Here's Walker. They get him, but not until he is at the 30. That should be a Georgia first down. Trying to run to his right and not being able to carry the ball in the right hand. And that's a handicap. It's a real handicap because it, it's just unnatural to cut back. And you can see that he just headed for the boundary. I think if he had been able to put the ball on his right arm, he would have set the blocker up and used what I like to call a power cut, turning back into the tackle and running over it. He's just short of the first down by inches. Homer Jordan watching from the sidelines. Native of Athens. Put it in the air. It is intercepted. A marvelous play by Terry Kennard. I don't understand the call. Well, the call is a gamble. It's not worth the risk leading by six points with a foot to go for a first down and Herschel going over the top. And last finger makes a mistake throwing into the area of all american last year consensus all american number 43 six interceptions last fall 11 for his career he is a center fielder deluxe he can make things happen he did all of last year that's a sensational play and clemson now with an opportunity from the georgia 41 and the play goes on the ground with jeff mccall carrying down to about the 37. But they got third down and a foot. Keith, unbelievable that you get the thinking that the defense at Clemson is so good that you're not going to take your best player, run him over your best blocker, and make a foot. As we look at the turnovers of now, even coaches sometimes get out guess themselves, and I think that's what Georgia did out guess themselves. Second down and seven. Homer Jordan sets to throw it, gets it off to Austin coming out of the backfield. Cliff is belted out of bounds by Terry Hogue. This is the third time that this same pass has been completed to Austin coming out of the backfield. Jimmy Payne again is the key to the Georgia pass defense because he has to apply pressure. Normally they go put one, not just one man, but two on him. As you can see right there, number 68, the left tackle Brown does a good job using his hands, which is legal under the present rule. Third down and a short three. Big play here. I don't know. It's going to be short. By two feet, I believe. The spot makes a big difference. McCall tried to get in behind big James Farr and wiggle for his first down. But Clemson will go for it, I believe. It, it, Circumstances are best served by taking a chance on fourth and one. Take your best runner and give it to him over your best blocker over the top. Nope. Well, they've got everybody spread out here trying to find a little daylight. They're going to let Homer do it. And I think he did it. It's according to the mark. It's according to where they marked the ball. It's still close, Keith. Will Forks was the defensive man for Georgia on the play. Sanchez also penetrating in there. Just he was reaching for all he could get out of that six foot frame of his. You see, Clemson has been stopped three times on short yardage. And so what did they do? They again outguessed themselves by going wide against the blitzing defense with a quarterback taking the ball five yards in the backfield and trying to turn forward and make it. It's going to be very close. I think it's two inches short. Only way to play Georgia's ball as they stopped Clemson, and we had unusual calls on both sides in that exchange of possessions. Here comes the blitz again, but the play goes up the middle with the fullback Barry Young. It's the big guys up front now. Defensively for Clemson, it's Glenn Benish, Perry Brown hit. They've got to assert themselves against Harper, Weaver, Radloff, Brown, McIntyre, and Kay. It'll be second down and about seven yards to go for Georgia. 
13 to 7 Bulldogs lead quarterback still got it turns it upfield takes a pretty good lick but he gets some yardage out of it about three and Dan Bennett 6'6 252 a senior from Harvard Ohio brings him down defensive coordinator Tom Harper tells me that number 66 William Perry six foot three 320 pounds has extreme quickness and here's a perfect example of it look at him fighting and getting through into the backfield and forcing last finger to go wider than he wanted to in for a short yardage third down and a long three now for Georgia well, again, the Clemson defense is looking at a big play. It goes to Herschel. And he does not get it. He does not get it. 66 Perry. Number 82, Trimble, Triplett. Danny Triplett penetrated and got the first blow on him. This Perry, number 66, again, goes around the block a little bit, and he's going to come out and help on the tackle and actually pulls the helmet all of Herschel Walker. Number 66, 320. Can dunk a basketball standing flat footed. You're kidding. That's what his coach told me. He told me that this morning. I asked him personally. I'm yes, sir, he said, I can dunk a basketball. I'm going to go over there and see that. <laughs> High snap to Broadway. Pressure on. He gets it out of there. Whoa, that was almost disastrous. Billy Davis going to run with it. Can't do it. Penalty flag down. Number 28 flying down the field. Melvin Simmons got him. Let's see what we got here. We might have a face mask. Or we might have a late hit. Well, oh, Georgia had great coverage. It's, uh, it's pointless to, to uh, unnecessary roughness. Yep. yep, late hit. That's 15 yards. So instead of Clemson being backed up on its own 12, they're going to get the football up at the 27, with 9.33 to play. Look at the penalty. You're going to see number 28, Simmons, make the play. He's got him in good shape. And then number 45, Mike Jones, is going to spear him with his head right there, piling on. And uh, they get a 15-yard penalty. We're ready to go. Homer Jordan with the ball out at his 27-yard line. Put stock still in motion. Homer still got it. Takes it, keeps it, turns it upfield, and gets it out to the 33. And the man that really took the feet from under is Tommy Thurston, number 60. What Georgia is doing to try to contain Jordan's spin out pass is blitzing the linebacker outside of the containment, giving him an extra man. Once Jordan breaks containment, he runs into the linebacker. Well, he's run eight times for 18 yards so far, so they've pretty well controlled him. Backwood is wide. Stock still in motion. Austin. And Cliff Austin. Gets it out to around the 37, close to the first down. Freddie Gilbert, number 90, is one of Georgia's premier pass rushes also, combining with uh, Jimmy Payne to make uh, it, it player quarterbacks a hard time. But Gilbert's been injured, but he gets in the ball game and makes a fine play. Freddie Gilbert, number 90. Change coming in for the measurement. We'll let you watch it while I tell you that tonight's game marks the beginning of ABC Sports' 12th year of involvement with an important college football tradition, the Chevrolet Scholarship Program. Program designed to extend recognition to the most valuable player from each school competing in televised play and to reward those outstanding performances with a $1,000 scholarship donation to the General Scholarship Fund of the respective college and university. The Chevrolet most valuable players from Georgia and Clemson will be announced toward the close of tonight's game. It is, as you saw, a first down for the Tigers. Jordan, out to McCall, he wanted to throw a pass. He wanted to throw a pass, and Jimmy Payne ate him up. What, what makes Jimmy Payne, number 87, so great? Anticipation. He has quickness, but he recognizes the play so quickly that the Clemson team does not have a chance to set it up. Number 87, all Southeastern Conference two years ago, last year, preseason All-America, as a perfect illustration of why. Second down. 16. 
So there was one of the gimmick plays that uh, they got stuffed with. The referee, Faith Williams, talking now to the two captains. Defensive holding against Georgia. I didn't see the flag thrown. I didn't either. Well, that one pinches, doesn't it? Does that change the complexion of this football game? Coming on to eight minutes left on the clock. And the illegal use of the hands. Against the red team, five-yard penalty, still first down. Palm is open. That's illegal use of hand. It was open. And five yards. First down. First and five. After 43. Out country. Jordan's changing the play. Yep. Stand up, pop the Magwood on the sidelines. Ronnie Harris brings him down, but he's got a first down, and he's got the football on the Georgia side of the field. This is the one thing that uh, Homer Jordan did so effectively last year. He read the defensive coverage one-on-one -on, -one on the boundary and just checked off to the quick pass for the first down. Remind you, it's 13-7. to seven. Touchdown and a conversion, and Clemson's got the lead. The missed field goal by Kevin Butler early in the in the third quarter. Looms bigger and bigger. Incomplete pass. He had him out there, too. He had stock still open, but he missed him. Well, he, he's not getting to turn his shoulders downfield because of the blitzing of the Georgia linebackers. The Georgia linebackers are, once jo Jordan decides to go outside, they run inside and put some pressure on him, and Forts was right there, forcing the bad throw. He's 11 out of 20 now, 75 yards, and two interceptions. And only 18 yards rushing, which is a real effective work by the Georgia defense. Gets his pass off to McCall. And he's got six. Maybe. The theory of Georgia defense is to concede the short pass, hold it to a minimum. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. They dropped back to cover the deep man, reacted up, and made the tackle for a short game. At the Georgia 41, it'll be third down and four. Here, comparison between Jordan and Lastinger. a marvelous catch by Stockstill. It was right on his fingertips. Jordan is rolling to the left. It's a very difficult throw. He wants to throw inside, but the man was covered, and Stockstill leaves his feet, juggles the ball, cradles it in, and time to make it complete. Watch this little maneuver by Stockdale going down the boundary and then outside, turning, making eye, establishing eye contact quickly with the ball quarterback and making the reception. Change on the field for the measurement. Could be a first down, or it might be fourth and inches. It's a first down. So the Tigers are still in the hunt. Just inside the Georgia 37. Well, the, the, both defenses have been very impressive. It's very apparent the pride that they take in their work. There's Vince Dooley and the two coaches, and it is getting tight, ladies and gentlemen. It is getting tight. Jordan's going to put it up. Loops it out there, and it's intercepted! He was trying to throw the ball to Cliff Austin, and Terry Hogue went up over the top and came down with a football. Jordan was throwing the ball. Austin does not even see the ball being thrown. And the little theory that I talked about earlier, Holt staying back and then coming up, he's in position to catch the overthrown pass, and Georgia has the interception. Ebb and blow of fortune with 6.45 to play in the game. 
man that made the latest big play for the Georgia defense. Now let's see what the Georgia decision will do here. They've got Herschel back there at tailback. Last thing are coming down with it, keeps it, and turns it upfield. You obviously expect them to remain as conservative as possible, but they do need to pick up a first down or two. Each running three downs and making a first down runs two minutes off the clock. Each first down, if you can use three downs and be successful, you can count two minutes off the clock. So we're coming down to six minutes and 20 seconds. Both teams have two timeouts remaining. And the ball off up front to Scott Williams, the fullback. And he punches on across the 40 to the 42. Where Dan Benish brings him down for Clemson. The Georgia offensive line got some movement on the Clemson defense. Brown at 240, Ratliff 265, Weaver 265. Now you get Norris Brown in at tight end. You get a double fullback situation in there. They're looking at third down and three. They've got Williams and Barry Young both in the backfield with Walker. I bet they don't throw the ball the pattern they did last time for the interception. Walker behind the two fullbacks. And he's got the first down. Second effort. was a great run and an important run. Now, Georgia can use two minutes more. Watch it again. You're going to see the two fullbacks leading Herschel. Clemson does not get the fast support. Number 26, Childress, misses him in the backfield. And then Holt, I'm sorry, Kennard misses him. And, no, I'm, Kennard makes the play. He was watching it, missed him in the backfield. Walker again, that little skip, but this time nothing doing. And Hedman was right there. Hedden and Perry. Mr. Perry sort of got him belly button to belly button, and uh, you do stop when you run into him, don't you? Yes, he's an amazing football player. He, he, as we watch him make this play on Herschel Walker, the coaches told me they put him on a diet earlier this fall, and he gained 15 pounds. <laughs> he gained 15 pounds on a diet. 320 pounds. Look at that guy. Yeah, He's just a sophomore. You can't put him on uh, cornbread and salty ham and <laughs> buttermilk. You can't call that a diet. <laughs> Last stinger keeps it. Turns it up field. And he's got decent yardage out of it. Well, oh, there is some head knocking going on in that line of scrimmage. The pride of both of these football teams. Why? As we look at Danny Ford. National champion two years ago, Georgia. Last year's national champion, Clemson, fighting their hearts out. Toe to toe, jaw to jaw, as we say. All the spirit and emotion there. That's Vince Dooley. It's third down and eight. He may have to put it up here, but Show it and let Herschel run with it. Pulls it down. Harrington comes out of the secondary to nail him down, so it'll be fourth down. And they'll have to give up the ball. With three minutes and 40 seconds to play in the game, and Georgia leading 13 to 7. Both defenses really show you the pride that they take in their play. Critical situations, the defense has made the play throughout the ball game. Well, let's see what Clemson decides to do. Looks, they, like, looks like they're going to go. They got nine up there. They're going after him. Just get it off. All he wants to do is catch it and quick it. Kick it they want to take a penalty. They're just going to use up the clock and take the penalty. They're trying to draw him off, trying to get Clemson to jump, and then decided, well, if they don't jump, we'll just sit here and use the clock and take the five yards because it won't make that much difference. We're on their side of the field anyhow, so that'll back them up five. And 3.01 to play. Delay against the red team. Every second from here on is going to be important for both teams. Now they'll get it away. And now Clemson's going to have 10 up there. They're going after it. Be careful and not rough the kicker. That's the one risk you take doing this. Good try, but he gets it off. 
And Davis Fair catches it at the 21. So the Clemson Tigers with two minutes and 55 seconds now to play in the ball game. Put the ball back. There is still time. Touchdown on the next report. There I have Sanford Stadium on the University of Georgia campus. The 51st meeting between the Clemson Tigers and the Georgia Bulldogs. And this like so many of them. Going right down to the last minute. 26 Georgians on the Clemson squad. Seven South Carolinians on the Georgia team. A little over an hour's drive between the two schools. And they are really throwing and scratching each other tonight. Opening the 1982 season. Danny Ford and Stooley. And here we go. Clemson's ball first down at their own 21. Homer Jordan gets his pass off. And it's into the crowd. Catch made by one of the equipment men. Once again, Jimmy Payne and the linebacker, Will Forts, number 42, forcing from the outside, made Jordan throw the pass, going back towards his own goal line. He's not very accurate doing that. 13 out of 24, 86 yards, three interceptions for Homer Jordan. He scored a touchdown. He's got it. It's a tie belongs to the offense. He's got it. Vince Dooley had to jump out there in a hurry to get some of his people away from the official. 24 yard pickup and that's the longest gain of the night. That's what Clemson. It's a drop back pass throwing out of the pocket giving Jordan plenty of time to look over the defense, and he goes right over on the boundary. Let's see if it's not a simultaneous catch right there by Magwood. Well, Tony Flack was there with him, but uh, Frank had the ball first, and as he was falling, uh, Flack seemed to get a hold of it. See if we can tell from this uh, camera. Magwood is going right to the outside. It's perfectly thrown. He has good concentration. Flack, the freshman, is coming up, but... No, Magwood has it all the way. What a what a great yeah. camera shot. It was simultaneous catch, if it was, belongs to the offense. Magwood is leaving the game. Shaken up, apparently, because the two Georgia players came crashing down on top of him. This is what is important now for Clemson. Two minutes and 43 seconds to play in the ball game. That hunker down you saw there, that's an old Georgia Bulldog try. Hunker down, you hairy dog. Homer Jordan gives the ball away to Mack. And Kevin Mack doesn't get a lot out of it. Must give credit to the Georgia linebackers. They have played outstanding football. Will Ford. Tommy Thurston and Nate Taylor have just been all over the football field, getting involved in play after play. Second down, about seven. Jordan comes back the other way with it. The pass is complete. Pass to Chuck McSwain out of the backfield. And he's got another Clemson first down. And the clock stops at 1.47 while they move the chains at the Georgia 41. So Clemson is still in the hunt. They were trying to get the ball to Max Swain, who has 4-4 four, four speed, the fastest player on the Clemson football team and on their track team as well. It's a throwback across, and you see how wide open Max Swain is. If he just got one step away from Sanchez, he would have been gone. Timeout now. And the timeout goes to Georgia. They wanted to reconnoiter what they, their plans are going to be. I guess they're thinking a little bit about the Sugar Bowl, how uh, they held the lead going into the last minute and a half and got beat on a touchdown pass the last few seconds of the game. 1.37 to play in the game. Georgia now with one timeout remaining. That's the face of Homer Jordan, who grew up right here in Athens, played uh, over at Cedar Shoals High School. Clemson now has two timeouts remaining. So the Tigers trying to benefit from the Georgia expenditure here. 
You're, you're certainly right. Uh, Frank, after that uh, change in the defensive call that opened the door for Marino to Brown, winning touchdown pass in the Super Bowl, has burned a lot of folks all winter long, summer long. I'm sure Bill Lewis, the defensive coordinator, and Vince Dooley was deciding, hey, fellas, let's take it easy. 137, two timeouts, we play our position. We can we can stop them, and uh, he's just trying to calm them down, calm them down, not make a critical mistake. It's first down, Clemson. He's tight. Vince Dooley is tight. I don't blame him. Jordan's pass too short. He was trying to get it again to McSwain, and he just simply did not get the ball to it. Once again, who was rushing to apply the pressure to the passer? None other than Timmy Payne. What a football game that young man has played tonight. 12 sacks last year during the season. What quickness he, he possesses. And the theory of, of rushing the passer is hit the offensive man before he gets set. Second down and 10. Jordan again sets it. Runs out of time. Tim Crow, 91. Tim overran him for a moment, but he kept throwing and scratching, and Danny Ford wants a timeout with a minute 16 to play. Georgia secondary covered every receiver Clemson sent out of the backfield. Watch Jordan. He has no one to throw the ball to. He looks left. The receivers are covered, and the only thing he can think to do is try to run, but Georgia was right there stopping him for no game. And so the Tigers will talk and try to find a play to get him in the end zone. Well, nobody left, did they? Not, not with this barn burner going down to the last second. And the referee's going to have to make a decision on the George, Georgia crowd noise. There he is. It's third down and 14 for Clemson. And about 13. Jordan getting better blocking around the corner. Gets his pass off and it goes into the crowd. The intended receiver fell down. Magwood. Remember, he was playing with a sore knee. He got his knee tucked back under him and apparently strained it earlier. Probably causing him some discomfort, losing some of his quickness out there. It is now fourth down and 13. This is the last chance that Clemson has. Fourth down and 13. They're going to have to pull out some kind of play to, because Georgia will concede them the short pass and try to cover everything deep. Georgia calls timeout. The Bulldogs have now spent their final timeout. With one minute and 10 seconds, everybody trying to collect their wits, trying to find something. Chevrolet celebrity. Well, here we go. Georgia with no timeouts remaining. Clemson with one, a minute 10. But more importantly, it is fourth down and 13 for Clemson. Jordan. Hit just as he throws the ball. It's intercepted by Nate Taylor. Tim Crow hit him just as he threw the football. And Georgia comes up with it. He was trying to go deep. And he just ran out of time. The best pass defense is a good pass rush. Perfect illustration of it. Disappointed Danny Ford. 13 game winning streak apparently has ended. Now all Georgia has to do is burn up a minute. Clemson with only one timeout. They can only stop the clock one time. Finger takes the snap. And let's go back and look at the play of the Georgia defense. The Georgia defense is ready to be praised. The only touchdown that Clemson got was after an offensive fumble on the level. But you're going to see 61. Crow hit him in the back. The ball goes out. 91. Crow go, hits him in the back. The ball goes right to the linebacker. And Nate Taylor, a walk-on four years ago, made the interception. 
Young Nate Taylor walked on this campus and led the Georgia team in tackles his freshman and sophomore year. Again, last thing it takes the snap and goes yeah. immediately to the grass. And that is it. You can sack up the bat. The clock ticking off the final seconds. The crowd of more than 82,000. And uh, of that group, at least 76,000 Georgia fans. The clock running it off. The game is over. The Georgia Bulldogs have defeated the Clemson Tigers by a score of 13 to 7. And Clemson with the longest winning streak in Division 1A football. The defending national champions have lost their opening game. But I'll guarantee you, both teams are going to walk a little slow tomorrow morning because it was a fight. The whirlpool will be full of Georgia players and in Clemson, the Clemson players. They are sore. Hart, the pride, was very apparent in this football game. Both squads gave everything they, could, they had trying to win. teams had opportunities. Both teams made mistakes. Final analysis probably evened out. Georgia won it 13 to 7. This well, they're still standing and cheering and starting all down the streets now as they file out of here singing glory, glory. That's the song down here when there's wind on the Georgia side anyhow. But as Frank said, a noble contest. Our most valuable players for Clemson. William Perry, the middle guard for Georgia. Jimmy Payne, defensive tackle. Their presence, not only what they actually did, both individually and collectively with their teammates, but their mere presence forcing both teams at times to go away from them. So they are the MVPs of the ball game. Each of the universities receiving a $1,000 contribution from Chevrolet for their general scholarship fund. And the blip tonight provided by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Once again, your final score. The Georgia Bulldogs, 13. The Clemson Tigers, 7. Travel arrangements made through. Promotion will be paid by United Airlines. United flies more people to Hawaii than any other airline. That's what friendly skies are all about. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as the leader in sports television. Saturday, T.J. Hooker's involved. Here and live from Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia, where tonight the Georgia Bulldogs scratched and clawed and fought their way to a 13-7 win over the defending national champion Clemson University Tigers. We'll be coming back for a live report a little bit later in Action News tonight. About the offense of this game, because without question, it was the defense Sure. that uh, really uh, came to prove the uh, the dogs the victor tonight. What we saw here were two very evenly matched football teams tonight. Clemson with a more experienced quarterback that may have given them the slight edge on offense. Both teams, though, about as staunch on defense as you can get, and it was defense that made the breaks for Georgia as expected. Sellout, capacity crowd, 82,142 jammed into Sanford Stadium. They and a national TV audience saw a tough defensive battle. First break of the game, third and seven for Georgia at their own 12-yard line. Last finger tries to hand off, but the ball is stripped away by Perry. Recovers for Clemson, and they're on their way. Three plays later, Homer Jordan from Athens. On third and five at the sixth, the quarterback draw. He's in for the touchdown. The point after is good, and it's 7-0 Clemson. The punting game was a big factor in this contest. Both kickers saw a lot of action, and it was only a matter of time before one of them made a mistake. Early in the second quarter, Clemson with the ball on their own 11. Hatcher to punt, but Dale Carver blocks it. Stan Dooley picks it up off the bounce, and watch Kenneth Sims, 57, shove him into the end zone. Right there. Get in there. You're going in for six. Uh, Butler's point after is good. It made it 7-all, and slowly the momentum in this game started to shift towards the dogs. It built even higher when Jordan looked to pass and was picked off by Carver. What a game he had. It rose to fever pitch when Herschel Walker entered the game. He was used only a few plays in the first as a decoy, and then on first and 10 from the Tiger 41, they go with a reverse to Tron Jackson, who's from South Carolina. He goes all the way for the score, but there's a flag on the play. Holding Georgia nullified the touchdown, but the Georgia defense was on their toes late in the half. Jordan to pass again, rolling to his left, but Tony Flack is there, and the freshman picks it off. Good job by Flack. 
Three plays later from his own 40. Lastinger on the run, fires to Charles Jr. He's wide open. The big receiver rambles 27 yards to the Clemson 33. The dogs settle for three from Butler, 39 yards out. And I mean, he drills it. He could have kicked it 50, 10 to seven at the half. He added a 23 yard field goal in the second half and a rigid defense gave the victory to the dogs tonight. The final was 13 to seven from Athens. So they avenged that loss of last year. The score was 13 three last year. Clemson 13-7 this year. Georgia will be going back to Sanford Stadium to talk to John Buren live in just a little while. All right, thanks, Steve. Many of the 80,000 fans who watch tonight's game are right now sitting in a traffic jam outside Sanford Stadium. Athens police tell us it could take to an hour and a half before the traffic thins out. But earlier today, Athens police were on the lookout, as they are now, for drunk drivers. The Athens Police Department was recently granted $600,000 to curb drunk driving in Athens during football season. As of this morning, only 10 persons have been arrested since Friday afternoon for DUI. Authorities say this is amazing, and they're attributing the low arrest count to media attention. Law enforcement officers on duty in Athens tonight include 96 Athens policemen and women, 34 state troopers, the entire Clark County Sheriff's Force, and the University of Georgia Police Force. And in Florida, some police departments believe Labor Day and the future of the workforce. Seven in a hard-fought, very physical football game. John Buren has been in Athens all evening, and he is standing by live right now at Sanford Stadium. John? All right, Steve, thank you. I'm with a couple of people who have been in Athens all evening and all afternoon and all morning, and it's been a very, very long day for all concerned. On my right, Jimmy Payne, defensive tackle from the University of Georgia, who, as not many people I do not believe were aware, came into this evening coming off of a shoulder separation of the right shoulder, wasn't it, Jim? Didn't, was not able to practice hardly at all this week and came in and just played a whale of a ball game this evening, putting pressure on Homer Jordan. How you feeling, babe? I mean, I know that thing was hurting. Now, how's it, how's it feel right now? Yeah, right now, it's kind of sore, but uh, the fact that we won, that kind of like helps me overlook it all right now. You constantly were up in Homer Jordan's face this evening, directly forced one interception. You were beating your man, it seemed, with great regularity. How were you able, was, were they not as good as you thought they were? They were as good as we thought they were, but uh, we just knew what we had to do coming to, into this game. We had to put quick pressure on Homer in order to kind of like slow up their offense. Emotional win for you all tonight. I know the, the crowd was really behind you, and when this crowd gets behind you, you know somebody's behind you, didn't you? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, glad, well, I'm glad they're here. Okay. Thank you. Jimmy Payne and Bill Lewis, the guy who put this Georgia defense together this evening with the loss of Freddie Gilbert. And what do you do? You put Stan Dooley in there, and all he does is score the only touchdown of the night. <laughs> You're a genius. What can I say, Lewis? Come on. <laughs> We're awfully happy, John, obviously. And uh, I'm happy for our football team. Guys like Jimmy who... Uh, just went out and laid it on the line for us and, and proved once again, people like him, that they're winners, that when, you know, we've got to have it, that they've been able to give it to us. And you mentioned to Jimmy, I'm happy for our fans. John, I've been in the game a long time. I've been in a lot of stadiums, and I don't think I've ever felt the enthusiasm in, in a stadium like was here tonight. I think our fans came to play. They deserve to win. I think our football team deserved to win. And at this moment, we couldn't be any happier. Bill, I was driving around campus about 1 o'clock this afternoon. And I can tell you with authority, they came to play because they, they, they were playing early and hard today. All right, look, you got BYU coming up now. We got five days to get four days to get ready for Brigham Young. And uh, they were on national television last week against the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Beat him 27 to nothing, and the kid Barry Young at quarterback looks like he could be another in the BYU mold of great passing quarterbacks. How tough is it going to be to get people like uh, Jimmy Payne and the, this defense pulled back together and ready to go against what appears to be a good offensive machine? Well, it's a big assignment, John, obviously. We knew that when we undertook it. We talked about our plan, and our plan is to about an hour from now forget this football game. We really do. We've got to turn our back on it and completely turn our attention to BYU. They're a good football team. We've got a short time to get ready, and it's going to be one of individual discipline to handle the situation and come out ready to play Saturday. Okay, a one-hour celebration. You hear that, Jimmy? Take it easy tonight, baby. You going to be all right? <laughs> all right. With Jimmy Payne and Bill Lewis, this is John Buren, live from Sanford Stadium in Athens, where the Bulldogs beat the Tigers tonight, by gosh. 13-7 to in the final. Steve? All right, John. Incidentally, Herschel Walker carried the ball 11 times and... <laughs>